Scientology could be called, well, you could call it a religion of religions. Howdy everybody and welcome to the Indie Scientology Podcast. I'm your host Andy Nolch, the Space Cowboy, and isn't it lovely to be here listening to the good old Strauss? This is a podcast for Scientologists who are not members of the church, the free zone. For people new to Scientology, this podcast is all about that odd religion you might have heard about. It's a collection of self-help books and mind exercises that became a religion in the 1950s. It was created by American sci-fi author L. Ron Hubbard. Today's show is a, um, it's not an interview, it's uh, just me playing a compilation of videos of Aaron Saxton, which I'll explain later. It's quite interesting. How did you like the last show with Michael Salihovich? If you liked it, please subscribe, click like, share, write a review. It all helps to get the truth out there because the truth really is out there. It's now time for us to go down that rabbit hole into the interesting world of Scientology where up is down and down is up, where left is right and right is left, where what you thought was impossible is possible. Welcome to the show on this 15th day of June, AD 71. Hello, welcome. So there is, there's an announcement I would like to make and... Um, It is that I am planning on um, moving on to a different uh, podcast, a different show, and uh, I won't be making uh, many uh, indie Scientology podcasts. Um, So yeah, I'm just moving on to other things and uh, my life mission and that sort of stuff. Um, But the show might continue with someone else, um, finding people, finding Scientologists and interviewing them. I will continue uh, interviewing people, but it it, uh, it won't be on. It won't be about Scientology. It'll be about different things. Um, so that's about it. Uh, in the current news, um, Melbourne's just come out of its fourth lockdown, but we're still got quite heavy restrictions. So it's like being in half a lockdown at the moment. Um, it's just outrageous. Um, And it isn't worst case scenario with this whole COVID event because they are failing at it. Um, So many people are waking up and so many people aren't getting the vaccine and stuff. Um, But it is bad that they're doing it. And I'm not going to try and be too positive about it. But but man, has it confirmed conspiracies? It has totally... It's it's made me a smarter person because now I really understand how the world works. Um, and if we become smarter from something, then I don't think it's a bad thing. So now it's time for a, um, a joke, a Scientology joke from the best ever book of Scientologist jokes. And here's one. A Scientologist was staggering home after a hard night of drinking with a bottle of wine in his back pocket when he slipped and fell badly. Struggling to his feet, the Scientologist felt something wet running down his leg. Please God, implored the Scientologist, let it be blood. Yeah, okay, really funny. Most of the jokes in that book are, are like that. Um, so now it's time for today's guest interview, and it's not an interview. Uh, it's 
me, um, what I did is I put together a bunch of, there was a bunch of short videos like on YouTube of um, Aaron Saxton, who's a former Scientologist who, um, anyway, I put together, because uh, because they were interesting interviews and I, they were interesting videos, but I put them together so it was all like one big interview. So although I didn't interview Aaron, if I did, stuff like what he talks about would come up in the interview. So kind of like a substitute interview with Aaron Saxton. Now, Aaron Saxton is a New Zealander who got involved with Scientology when he was uh, young. So he joined the Sea Org probably when he was a teenager or something. And he probably left the Sea Org when he was like 27 or something. But he'd managed to get up to a high part in the church and he'd found out some really interesting things. And he ended up getting annoyed with you know, being a Sea Org member and, and he blew and left Scientology and stuff. Um, and then he became a protester and um, he um, spoke a lot when, like around 2008 and stuff, when there was a lot of that anonymous thing with the protesting thing. Um, and and then he seemed to have cut a deal or something like that or offered some sort of payment and then he just went quiet and that's it. He never talks about Scientology again. Um so uh, even if I did try and interview him, um, I doubt that um, I doubt I strongly that I'll be able to get an interview with him because he has seemed to has cut some sort of deal where he's not allowed to talk about Scientology again. So that's all okay in that and interesting. But what's really interesting is something that he mentions towards the end of this um, of this compilation. Um, and it's really deep data. He basically saw a secret flag order by LRH. And in this video, he says his interpretation of what he read of the flag order. And I don't know if he is saying what LRH said or if he is saying his interpretation. And it's a very interesting thing. It involves a Holocaust, basically. And you're going to have to get up to that section of Thingo and listen to it for yourself and decide. Um, but... Um, it's just really interesting because I am recently have been making some videos about OT8 and this could tie into the OT8 videos. Um, and to be honest, I really, really, I will eventually one day, I'll hunt Aaron Saxton down and I just want to get an answer to his question. I want to find out, you know, what you said here, is this what it said or is this your interpretation? Because he said, he said, he says this, he goes, LRH um, labeled the Jews for extermination. And did LRH actually label the Jews for extermination or did LRH just point out the Jews tend to be affected by body thetans or something and that's why they're being bad or something like that? Because they're, they're, they're very he, – he implies the Sea Org – one of the Sea Org's missions is to knock off the Jewish body type in order to set us free. And so there, I've given you, I mean, now you're going to want to skip forward towards the end of the, of the video because it is pretty interesting. It's like, whoa. Now, anyway, it's just like, it's a really big thing to drop. And the reason why I want to make this compilation is because it's got in, in good information throughout the whole thing. But when you listen to the whole thing, you, you realize this guy's not lying. He's not lying about his experiences. And in this last bit of the interview when he says this outrageous thing, 
I don't think he is lying. So that's why I think he's worth listening to. But is he is it his interpretation of what LRH wrote or not? It's very interesting. Because there was some other big successful person here on earth who called for, who wanted to do a similar thing. He didn't actually do the extermination camps. That's a big exaggeration. They just knocked off the people who couldn't work. They wanted workers. They did not want to kill them. That's why they had a sign saying the truth will set you free because it was like saying, you know, this is, this is a working camp for the war effort. Work hard and we'll win this war and then you'll be free. And, he, and it was likely they were going to move the Jews to Madagascar or to Israel or something and start up their own place. And I do absolutely believe that secretly um, they would have um, done a social engineering thing and reduced the population of, of the Jews. So, like, I, I believe secretly Hitler did have a plan to exterminate them from Earth because he thought they were dangerous. But... Um, it wasn't in the death camp form. That's bullshit. Okay, it's really exaggerated. Occasionally there was like some crazy Nazi who got pissed off with some workers and just like shot 500 of them in a row into a pit. But there wasn't like Jews just rocking up at a camp and just getting straight straight sent to the... Um, the they weren't death camps. It's It's been totally over-exaggerated. And you, you can't talk about these sorts of things because you get taken off YouTube. And so it's been very heavily covered up. The reason why is because Israel is a country. Israel is created by invading Palestine, right? And they've used the whole justification that we were picked on by the Jews. And they say even for the past, sorry, we were picked on by the Germans. And they say for the past 5,000 years, we're poor Jews and we've been picked on. We were kicked out of Egypt and, or whatever. We were slaves in Egypt and we were kicked out of this country. And so all poor little Jews. So they've used that as an excuse to just go into Israel and just invade and take over and drop bombs on the Palestinians and stuff. So, do you know how they use like a false COVID in order to achieve something? The Holocaust has been another thing where they've taken a little bit of truth about the working camps and some Jews dying and stuff and just totally exaggerated it and used it as an excuse to um, create... Israel the country out of nowhere because there was no Israel country it was always Palestine and these the and Britain came in the Britain's very tied in well with the, the Jews it's very Jew controlled Britain and they helped set up um, Israel and and then the, then the, the British pulled out and then it was just Israel now now it's Israel and Palestinian having a war and they've just Invaded and they just they've literally came in as like a hyper right wing nationalistic like we are Jews this is our nation we're taking this land and we're fighting for it and that's why I get a little bit angry on this topic because if you're like a a red blooded American it's like I want to stand up for American values I don't want the country being flooded with immigrants you're considered a racist and it's totally unfair it's totally one one behavior it's totally hypocritical because they can be nationalistic they can have um, marriage laws where you can only marry Jews can only marry Jews and stuff they can be very Nazi like in that we're protecting our nation and this is a, like the Jews in Israel are Nazi like in, in their philosophy towards things and standing up for themselves but then if another nation does a similar thing they accuse them of being racist and I really hate that hypocriticalness and it's totally unfair because the other races and countries can fall to shit, but the Jews can have their little nation, and it's just totally unfair. Anyway, getting off topic and sensitive things, but I have to tell the truth. Um, so, um, anyway, what I was saying is there's another big person on earth, like a, another person who was a, I think the word big being, and he also came to the conclusion that it was necessary to get rid of a certain body type here on Earth because the body type causes problems, basically. Um, and it honestly seems like LRH might have come to the same conclusion as well. And just on that topic, because I haven't finished it off, the Hitler thing, he wasn't just going to put him into camps and wipe him out, out, that's made up, but he was going to do some sort of secret long-term population reduction program. In fact, what's being done to 
white people in Australia, America, and England. <laughs> He's going to do something like that. So they're probably going to put send them to like Madagascar, and then secretly corrupt vaccines on that island so that the women are sterile, and that that reduces the Jewish DNA here on Earth. That was the honest plan, and it was actually the Germans who first invented the idea of using a vaccine to sterilize a woman. And they did it, they experimented on women in the concentration camps. And they literally were the first to invent that. Is that in fact when you look into this these sorts of things, it's quite interesting how many things that the Germans were first to invent. They were first to go into secret underground bases bases and have like a breakaway civilization. They were first to meet up with aliens, honestly. I know it's a crazy topic, but they met up with the reptilians and stuff, cut deals. They were first to build UFOs. And so America has copied so many things off the Germans. Um, but so the Germans invented this way of injecting someone with something and then um, it actually um, uh, that stops the, the woman's ability to um, get pregnant. Um, and so uh, it, it, I do really think that the Germans absolutely would have pulled the Jews out of Europe and put them into a certain location and then would have secretly, you know, said, here, have you your tetanus vaccine or whatever, and then slowly reduce their population down. Um, so anyway, so he came, to the, the the Germans came to, around World War Two. the Nazis and that, they came to that conclusion, and so Hubbard might have came to the same conclusion. And I know that sounds absolutely outrageous, right? But you have to understand that Hubbard was for freedom, and that sort of stuff. And he was for finding out what is the cause of the problems here on earth, finding the why, what is it? And he might have come to a why that a certain group of people were being manipulated by interdimensional entities and that's what's making them enslave us with psychiatry and banking and all these sorts of things. Remember, who is Freud? Who were the top bankers? You know, who's Edward Bernays? You know, anyway, um, of course, I'm not saying they're all bad. I have to really clear that up. But I'm just saying that I, I don't know why other people can't see this, but I can acknowledge that there are different races here on Earth and that some have different abilities and some of those abilities are good and some of those are bad. And I could totally understand if Hubbard or other top people in the government or something, sat down and said, look, I see a problem here. This body type needs to be gotten rid of. And I, I could understand that idea. I don't find that out. Like, I don't... It To me, it's like, okay, like, it, it's, I ma- it makes sense how someone would come to that conclusion. I'm not saying we should do it or I agree with it. I'm just saying I understand that idea. Most people have no idea about this because they haven't studied Nazism. They don't know anything about the the different racial types or even the, the different abilities between men and women. They've been brainwashed by this whole leftist idea that we're all the same, which is just completely bizarre and retarded. And for people who think that Hubbard thought that it was a Satan who did everything, right, Hubbard didn't really think that. Towards the end of his life, he did a backflip and actually recognised that the body... Actually, no, it wasn't even towards the end. He knew all along. You can listen to the South African lectures where he criticizes the South African blacks. So he, he never, he, Hubbard is just a, he's a dodgy person because he sells you on this idea of, oh, the Satan is, Satan's magical, the Satan's everything. And then he sort of comes out and then says, oh, oh, no, actually, it's the body that you're in. And the body determines your talents and your abilities and if you're evil or not and stuff. And so it's just, he's a really funny guy. Anyway, so here's this long video and you work out for yourself. But I, I one day, I do want to speak to this guy and get this clarified because I think it's fascinating. I have heard from Nibs Hubbard, which is Aaron Hubbard's son, who also seems to be being honest as well. And he says some outrageous shit like Hubbard was involved in drug dealing and stuff. But now that I look at it, Hubbard could have been a CIA agent and it makes sense. So he, he might have totally 
because the CIA was into importing drugs and it's how they fund their little operations. And Hubbard might have justified it in that it's for the greatest good. You know what I mean? So it doesn't shock me, but Hib- Nibs said that Hubbard might have stolen a nuclear weapon. Well, Hubbard wanted to steal a nuclear weapon to take over the world. And it sounds totally outrageous, but then when you stop and you think about it and you go, no, Hubbard really wanted to be the king of the world and he really wanted to just fix up this correct system. And I understand why he would want to steal a nuclear weapon and then threaten the governments or something like that and try and take over it. A part of me would love to get a nuclear weapon and say, hey, fuck you, Biden. Get out of being the president. You stole the freaking presidency. And you guys who are secretly manipulating Biden as a puppet, I'm in control of the whole government now. So part of me would like to be would like to have a nuclear weapon. I obviously wouldn't try it because it would be so hard to steal a nuclear weapon, but I totally understand it in somebody who dream, dreamt big and wanted to change the world. So I don't think it's outrageous to happen to want to steal a nuclear weapon, but it sounds like an outrageous statement, right? And this Holocaust thing is another outrageous thing, but when you just stop and you look at things and you look at all the information, you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I, I don't think it's that outrageous, but at first you're like, whoa! It was like years ago when I first heard Alex Jones, Alex Jones mention that Hitler survived the war and fled to um, South America. I kind of almost laughed and was like, oh, that's ridiculous or whatever. But then you look into it and it's totally the truth. It's totally what happened. And it just it's not an outrageous statement at all. So... I don't know, we have this thing where we first hear something that's unusual and we just go into shock or not belief. Then as time goes on, we're like, whoa, and we actually believe it. So anyway, I've looked at these things and I actually believe that what Aaron Saxon says says in this video might actually be true. And to me, listening to the whole thing, this is why I put, that's is why when I edited it, I put the video where he says the outrageous statement right at the end. So you can listen to him all the way through And you can tell that he's not lying. He's not being shifty. He's telling you about his real experience of the church. And yes, some things might be interpreted incorrectly, but he's not lying. He's not full of crap. He's just, he might have just be a little bit over emotional or interpret things wrong. He might be the real deal. Anyway, I've been talking for ages. I just thought I had to do a big explanation as an introduction to this. And so let's dig into this. Chuck on a big pot of tea, and let's hear some talk about the world's most interesting and controversial religion, the Cadillac of cults, Scientology. And this is Aaron Saxton. After all, we haven't been invited, and curiosity often leads to trouble. Oh, 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 oh. So, Aaron, can you give us a um, brief history of yeah. your experience in Scientology? What happened is, uh, I'm 35, I was born in 1974, and my parents were in Scientology. So, I actually did a couple of courses, but wasn't really involved that much with Scientology until I was 15. And when I turned 15, I actually joined on staff and became a member of the Sea Organization. Um, at the age, just after my 15th birthday yeah. and I stayed there until I was uh, 21 so I did six years uh, for them and then after that I was involved in Scientology again for another year and a half before I finally left it for good and I haven't been involved since then. So you were in the Sea from when you were say 15 to about 22 or something? That's correct, yes. So how did that affect you as a young man? I mean like you missed out those some of those prime years there it was hard because I didn't know what I was missing until afterwards. I, how I dealt with life in there was, was difficult because, I mean, as a, as, as a young man, I was trying to, uh, trying to grow. I was trying to go out and, and find different likes and dislikes, and all of that was crushed because the only liking you could have was for the purpose of the seal. Uh, the only liking you could have was for the music produced by Golden Era Productions. The only books you could read were from L. Ron Hubbard. You know, you couldn't go off and read this or that. You couldn't listen to radio. You couldn't read the newspapers. You couldn't buy magazines. You know, you couldn't even watch TV. So yeah. your whole life was that. And, you know, as a young man, I, I wanted to, you know, I was growing. You know, I was going through puberty. Yeah. And 
you wouldn't think it was wrong to want to, to love another human being. You, you wouldn't think it was wrong to show emotion or like li liking towards a, a woman. Yeah. And the moment you do that in there, you're punished. You know, I, I wanted to experience sex. I wanted to touch a female body. And the moment I did it, I'm dragged into this office by these men that tell you you're an ape. You're an ape for masturbating. You're, you're evil for having even considered the idea of of, of, of touching this woman outside of marriage, you know, and, you know, I look around me and see the people that are married in this place, and they don't even get to see their wives, so why would I want that? I just wanted to know what it was like to kiss a woman, and this is punishable, and I'm, and, you know, and I'm forced onto the decks, and I'm made to clean and do hard labor as amends to repent for it, and I'm, and, and I'm, hailed in this office and told read this this shows that you know if you think about ejaculation if you think about touching a woman you're an ape you're not in control of your emotions yeah. you know I'm a young man I'm hardwired this is what this is what young men young women do and you're left there with a ch with a choice how do I handle this how do I resolve not wanting to to express this desire so you come up with a solution yeah and the solution was horrible. I have to stop wanting sex. I have to stop it because, and then when you try to stop wanting it, the they take you in an interrogation, and and the thought of wanting to have sex. Well, the thought leads to the action. Therefore, don't even have the thought. Right. So, how do you deal with this? How does your mind cope? Well, I started to comprehend things. I'd get an erection, and I'd think of something like cockroaches, or a horror film, or vampires or anything, something that would ugh, make me go like that so that I could turn it off and, and let my erection go down. I wore tight pants, tight underwear so that it would crush and cut off the blood there so that it couldn't act, so it couldn't do what it was supposed to do, which was grow and erect and make me want to go off and have hormones. Yeah. You know, anything that turned that on, I wanted to turn it off. Yep. And this goes on and on and on and eventually your mind identify sex with real pain because the action results in such pain in, in the SEA organization, in Scientology ma management, it results in such punishment that it is evil for you to do this. Yeah. It, this is a fundamental dynamic and a right of a human being and a desire and, you know, it's gone. It's crushed. And while everyone else out there was going through that between their great teenage years and experiencing and finding out true love, I was... I was finding out what it was like to be punished for the thought. Yeah. Of it. So after you left the seal, say when you were 22, how did that affect you then? I mean, how did you cope with that after that? Can you imagine? I'd been doing it for so long, having these images in my mind to turn me off from having sex. That yeah. When it actually came time to be with a woman properly outside the church confounds and have sex. Yeah. I had to have the lights off, not not for some arousal reason, I had to have the lights off because I had to close my eyes and now I had to have those images in my mind, those horrible images to have sex because my body over the last six years got used to the idea of having the erection and having these mental images of terror and ugly disgusting things and the body got overrode it and said right we will have an erection now when you have these ideas. So when I'm with this woman, I'm not thinking about the woman. I'm not even thinking about other women. I'm thinking about anything else other than sex so that I can now have sex. And if, if you want to talk about dysfunctional, this doesn't even begin to comprehend it. I feel sorry for my wife that I had in Melbourne. I feel sorry for her because she didn't understand why sex was so hard for us. Why emotion, why touching, why the speaking of the word love was just a foreign idea to me. Yeah. You know, touching. That's, you know, my mind goes, heavy petting, don't do it. My mind just jumps to this, you know, don't touch in public. Yeah. In, in private, don't do anything. Wait till you go to the bedroom only. Yeah. You know, we're talking about a real trick for your mind. Yeah. Dear oh dear. Um, can you describe what you think that you became or, or how you became as a SEAL member? You've spoken to me before about, um, yeah, the fact that you feel like that wasn't you and now you're trying to find you back, get you back. 
I didn't know what to do to to survive, to feel good. I had to do something that resulted in happiness. And when you're in an environment that only rewards you, only rewards you when you've done what is needed to be done, as opposed to what you think should be done or what is right. After years of that, you decide, I'm going to do what I need to in order to get an applaud. I'm going to do what I need to in order so I can sit down and be in peace. And often those things, unfortunately, meant in my position there in the church, being always in the communications office, always in charge of ethics and morality issues for staff, was such a heavy burden on punishment and making people do what I wanted to do. That That's where I got my enjoyment from. I didn't... Yeah, I, I didn't have friendships like that. My friend could be a friend the next day, and then I'd, the next day I'd be penalising them out of a job. So I had to learn that you didn't get happiness from friendships, and relationships were a no go. Where do you get happiness from? Enjoying what you must do, and that's where I got my happiness from. Right or wrong had nothing to do with it. I didn't even con those two words did not come into the equation. Right. And unfortunately for the human beings around me that were very much not treated like human beings, they suffered because of the result of that. Because they were dealing with a man here that looked at them like this. And now here I am as an adult outside of that and I'm looking around at people. They're no longer assets, they're no longer parts of a machine, they, they demand respect, they want to be treated like a living thing. I'm still trying to get there. I'm sorry, but for six years of my life, non-stop, every day, assets, they're parts of a machine and I must make them work. So you didn't consider, or you didn't view them as people with feelings or... Well, you can't, no, because even the concept of dealing with their feelings or am I going to ignore their emotions didn't even come into the equation anymore. What has that got to do with what I've got to do for the church? I'm sorry, I have got to get this product, I have got to get this done. Their consequence of how they felt about it can't be part of the equation. It, and it can't be part of my equation. I got to a point where I, I didn't lose sleep. If I asked this person to have an abortion, I didn't lose sleep. I didn't even think twice after it. My only consideration was, God, I don't have to fill that post again with another person because they're going to abort. Or if they did decide that they were going to have the baby, then I was going, Christ, I have to hire someone to replace them. There was no joy. There was no celebration. There was no announcement. Hey, Monica Potter's going to have a baby. The joy of life. This, there was no announcement of this. Yeah. Instead it was, Monica's betrayed us, and she's going to leave the organization, and we're going to have to work harder, because she's betrayed the trust. That's the viewpoint. It was never the word love spoken in one single conversation. Yeah. No, it's do this. You know, I'd look out on the public Scientologists, at least they had the option to have that. Yeah. As a staff member that in the Sea Org, there wasn't that option. You could have a relationship, you could have love. Public Scientologist, he had the joy of getting auditing and this apparent privilege to speak. I had the penalty, I had security checks and interrogation every two months. That was my auditing. When something went wrong with a Public Scientologist auditing, you had a chance to get it corrected. I didn't. We went off to the cramming office and were told, M9, you know, clear up your misunderstood words, you're out ethics. Yeah. You know? That was my experience. Your experience, you had a win in Scientology, you enjoyed a moment. You could go out to a cafe and talk to your friends. The moment I had anything out of it, I come out of the audience says, five minutes later, I'm back on post. Right, who am I going to court martial today? Yeah. Or who's on my list to go off and get? So what was your post when you were doing this? Most of the years I spent was over in Los Angeles, and there I was the I was in charge of the, the communications or the establishment division of the messenger organisation. And the messenger organisation are those people that are charged with the highest authority within the church 
to basically do what's ever needed at any time, written or verbal, is not applicable, and enforce that upon management. So whereas management were over local management units within continents that were then over the organisations, we were over management and overrode their decisions or asked them to do whatever was needed. Because often parts of the puzzle didn't understand why they were doing particular activities. It seemed innocent enough. Yeah. But only the CMO and RTC were actually in full control of the facts. Why do we need that org over there, that organisation, to do particularly well right now? Why? Well, maybe we've got a legal case coming up and we need to strengthen the field out there. We need to get that part working. Right. It's all about the church. I don't care. I didn't care about the individuals involved. They just, can we get it done? You're, you're a piece of meat. We called you, we called staff members coins. That was the term. When we had a, when we had a person that we could get a position filled with and we'd shove them off to flag, you know, shove them down to Florida. It didn't matter if he had a child there. It didn't matter if he had a wife in Los Angeles. That's not the point. I can take this guy, I can send him over to the flag land base and I can fix that problem. And then he starts screaming about the fact that he's away from his family. It's like, excuse me, SEAL policy says you will do anything required of you in the name of the SEAL and you will do it. If you don't, you're in ethics conditions. Do you have doubts about being a SEAL member? Do you, you have doubts? You're a suppressive person. Do you want to be declared? We're going to have to tell your wife and kids that. And then you go, you separate them off. Right, your communication's over. Talk to the wife. I'm sorry, but your, your, your husband has decided that he's got doubts on the SEAL. He's not willing to perform his duties. And, you know, we've done a security check on him. And I'm sorry to tell you, but he's actually thought about going out to D on you. He's thought about other women. Right. You know, he's not really in line with the purpose anymore. And sadly to say, you're not part of his equation anymore either. You can do something about this. You can leave him and stay in the seal. You can do this. And sure enough, she sits down there and goes, geez, why did he go to the, why did he go to Florida and walk away from me? And then she takes a look at it. Was he a good father? Oh, I never got to spend time with him anyways. What, what value is he really as a, as a partner? Because there is no value, because you don't have time to have a relationship. So it's not hard for that person to go, right, I will divorce. If you took a look at the statistics of the SEAL and every member in it and looked at how many marriages they had, we've got people that have been married two, three, four, five times. Yeah. And this is all from a church that claims to be able to solve these problems in relationships. And just about every SEAL member has got a history of one or two marriages. So how often did that happen? Well, you, you described about, you know, talking to the wife and getting that marriage to be dissolved. How often did that happen? Well, quite a lot. That you I mean, knew of? Well, quite a lot. I mean, let's understand one thing. When I was over in Los Angeles working there, we had the entire middle management, some 500 staff. Now, this was the late 80s, early 90s, wasn't it? Uh, uh, mid-90s. Mid-90s. 93, 94, 95, okay. 96. We had around 500 staff. Now, if you could imagine for a moment possibly having uh, each staff member being in some serious trouble perhaps twice in a year. That equated to a 1,000 incidents per year. Over my three-year period, that's some 3,000 incidents. Now, this staff member over here may hear about something. But from my position in the communications office, we're the ones who are dealing with it every day. Yeah. So I dealt with this quite a lot. How many instances, you asked? I couldn't even give you a figure. It would be, you're, if we were going to talk about specific incidents of sitting a guy down about his marriage, or the, the, the issue with talking to his family, yep. then we're talking hundreds. Right. Some of these young kids, they're all from around the world. They've got no other hope other than the hope that we give them. They've been told to disconnect. Their families are asking for them back. They want them back for Christmas. Yep. We don't want them to go away on Christmas because we know if we send them away, if we allow them to go, 
there's a high probability that they're not going to want to come back. So don't let them go in the first place. Right. Now, what happens is the family arcs, arcs up, goes, come on, you're entitled to several weeks leave per annum, come back, have it. What I would do? Give them a security check, give them an interrogation. I'm sorry, but you did this wrong. You're going to have to do conditions, you're going to have to do liability. This could take you several months. We can't approve your request for leave. Denied. And then the family starts sending letters. What are you involved in that they, you can't even take time off? I received the letter. All communications to the staff from the public are monitored. I see the communication. I go, oh God, they're going to get them out. So I pull the staff member in, put the letter over here. Excuse me, um, your family I think is anti you being here. And they'll look down and go, God, I know. They know it. Of course they're anti them being there. They haven't been able to see them in a year or two. Yeah. And you talk to them you go, well, what you're doing here in the sea world in Scientology is far more important than your immediate family. Let's get them on the phone and talk to them. And you coerce them into talking with them, giving them a public relations story. Oh, I will come back in a month or two. Another month or two goes past. They start getting angry. They start making phone calls. You start blocking off those calls and finally you tell the staff member, you know what? It's time to disconnect. They're really against you being here. And guess what? The staff member goes, you know what? They're right. Because I talk to them and they just yell and scream at me now and start criticizing Scientology. They must be crazy. So disconnect. Okay, disconnect. Good. Fair roads, fair weather. You only write them, write them once a month. Talk about how great it is, talk about, tell them you're having fun. You don't want to get them upset about you. This, eventually the family line disappears. And yeah. then one day, this person wants to think about leaving the city. Well, how are they supposed to? They've got nowhere to go in life. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have credit cards. They don't even know what's going on out in the world. There's no newspapers. There's no television. There's no magazines. They're completely dependent upon now the life that you give them. Yeah. Yep. What do you do as a human being if you even know you're a human being anymore? If that concept is still real to you? You haven't gone off and played sports. You haven't sat and been to a movie together. You've worked 14 hours a day. You're a machine now. Yeah. And machines don't have the luxury of thinking. You yeah. just do. You just do, do, do. Yeah. So tell me, what's your take on um, DM being responsible for this, as opposed to, say, uh, LRH and Scientology itself? Oh, it's good for somebody to point the finger and blame that one man in his, in his entirety, one tyrannical man. Yes, David Miscavige is tyrannical, but I was just the same. I was one of those. There's no difference between DM and myself. There wasn't. I would have done everything he did, and I did. And others as well had did others. the same. We're all created, but where did that creation come from? What makes it okay? Okay, I'll tell you what does. What you see, what the public out there see is when Scientology's policies are criticised, we'll get together these books, we'll get together these volumes of policy letters, and we'll show the world these are your policies. Um, well, guess what? but we won't show you what the C organization runs off of. Our own separate set of orders from Ron. Our own flag orders, numbering in the thousands. We have Office of Special Affairs special orders. We have special training materials for messengers. Special orders only for messengers. And even within the C org, most of the flag orders are not even known to the very SEAL members, but they are to management. And then within management, even a smaller group are privy to the other policy letters. These policy letters dictate these actions that they are okay. Altercations between staff members are acceptable. This yeah. is Ron's words. In these his physical alterca altercations. That's correct. These words are not heard by or known by public Scientologists. These are his words saying you can beach a human being and throw him overboard. This is Ron Hubbard saying you may put a person in the rehabilitation project force and bar all communication with other human beings. That you may be punished for communication. I'm talking any communication. 
unless prompted to, and, and instructed to speak. Yeah. These are policies that say the purpose of the seal has nothing to do with the creed of Scientology. This is about putting ethics in on the planet, and it's about control. These these policies instruct and guide you on how to take care of an enemy network or group of people that are attacking the Sea Org of Scientology. These are not the same policy letters you see, or a public Scientologist and what you call the Potential Trouble Source Suppressive Person Rundown Course. These are far more aggressive than anything you've ever imagined. And that's the machine. David Miscavige is just enforcing the policies and following them as a zealot. Yep. He's not making this stuff up. These policies really exist to do this, to act in that way, to use aggression. So how many others would know about these policies or these, you know... A number. We, I'll give you an example. I was surprised to hear Marty Rathburn's departure from the church. Right. I met Marty Rathburn several times and was involved with him at the Flagland base up in Los Angeles and I also met him on the ship. And what amazed me is that people like Marty Rathburn and Mike Rinder aren't talking about anything. They don't even see what the real crimes here. I mean, they're talking about David Miscavige giving him a slap. I'm sorry, but this happened. This happened throughout the Sea Organization. Foster Tompkins used to beat staff. DM used to do it. They're not the first people to hit another human being. Yeah. What What shocked me though is that Marty Rathburn, Mike Rinder were involved in having staff members being fed beans and rice for weeks at a time at the Flag Land Base and in the Hollywood Guarantee Building, denying children nutritional supplements. Mike Rinder in specific, allowing young men and boys, young men and women to be hired and how did we fix their educational requirements? We paid a Scientologist out in Los Angeles to give them a certificate that said they had approved educational standards. Yet Mike Rinder and Marty aren't even looking at these things as crimes. They're not looking at the fact that we didn't even provide medical uh, provisions for staff. We didn't have women get pap smear tests to check for cervical cancer, to check their eyesight. The answer to everything is, we'll audit you, but you don't get auditing. And there's Marty Rathburn and Mike Rinder talking about, I got slapped by David Miscavige, and that's their big crime in 20 years. I'm sorry, that's not the crime. And why aren't they talking about it? Maybe they don't even think that what they did was a crime. The only reason they're talking about David Miscavige slapping them is because they felt physical pain. To them, that's a crime and labelling David Miscavige as the cause of all this? Untrue. Marty Rathburn himself has reamed out staff. Marty Rathburn himself has been tyrannical. Mark Inger has been tyrannical. Mark Yeager, a tall, imposing figure and often the head of the Commodore's Messenger organisation, a very imposing individual who has walked around the organisations going, set check him, you're off post, you do this, you're going on mission, you're out ethics. They're not even talking about these incidents. David Miscavige had nothing to do with those. And that's how Mark Yeager liked to run his messenger organisation. That filtered down through management. I was running around the Hollywood Guarantee Building. You're out ethics. Sorry, we've got a policy in the church, in the seal, that says I can RPF one person out of Flag Bureau every week. I don't need justification. I just need to keep you on your toes. Who's it going to be this week? Better not be the down statistic guy. You could be next. Watch it. Then fear is the dominating factor. Fear gets compliance. Yeah. Willingness doesn't. LRH talks about using affinity to obtain compliance. Only for a public Scientologist. Look into the policy letters and it's rife. The SEALG's policy letters are rife with aggression and command and discipline for even misaddressing a senior officer and sometimes in the mind of a person probably viewing this video it would be hard to reconcile the two different human beings I'm talking about Alron Hubbard the founder Alron Hubbard 
the dictator and commodore of the sea organization but the two people are the same and people may be listening to this who have been in the sea org know this is true and thought that it was the exception that they were treated like that yeah it's not the exception it's the rule and the higher you go up the worse it gets the problem is you can't disagree yeah. Because if you disagree, even mentally, you'll get a security check. And one of the questions will be, have you thought? So now it becomes wrong to even have a thought. So if you can't do, you can't think, you can't compute now. So now you have to turn off that part of your mind that even thinks. Because you can't afford to think, is it right or wrong what my senior just did? Yeah. So tell me, when... Um um, these sealed people saying the HGG building in LA, whatever, were getting the beans and rice and weren't getting medical attention and things. What was the scene for the guys in the upper management? Guys like Mark Yeager, Guillaume Lazev, Marty Rathbun, Mike Rinder. What, what was the scene for them? Lavish. Um, I'll give you an example. Lavish? Lavish. Spending. Yeah. For them, uh, I'll give you an example. About three times a year, David Miscavige, Marty Rathbun included, uh, Guillaume Lesev, the Executive Director International, various members of the Watchdog Committee, would all come down to Florida. We had for them special apartments built at the Hacienda Gardens that were just gorgeous. Spanish marble, layered throughout, luxurious kitchens, gymnasiums for them with the latest equipment. We, I, I arranged the purchase of one piece of gym equipment at a cost of almost 10,000 US dollars. And you know what they did with it? Ronnie Miscavige got up on it and did his little trick of hanging by his toes. This is David Miscavige's brother. Yeah. And that's how amusing the instrument was to him. It was a toy. And then we would take cash funds and we would allocate vast amounts of money to get Grand, uh, Pontiac Grand Am so they could drive around the luxury. I'd arrange drivers if they wanted drivers to drive them around while everyone else walked or got on a packed bus. Uh, their diets were special. They had special nutritional requirements, so we would buy wheatgrass and wheatgrass juices and fine coffees from France, coffee houses and crackers from Switzerland. You know, you'd have to make this shit up almost to believe it. And But this was their budget, and then we would take that huge amount of cash and it would be exhausted, and then we would justify the expense through falsification of some kind of a record or receipt that we could get from a public Scientologist or something, and that was declared the usage of the monies. But right. we're talking thousands of dollars here. The average SEAL member got less paid to him in one year than what one executive would have just spent on his luxuries in a week. And this is how they lived. Uh, I got a $10 SEAL shirt. Marty Rathburn, David Miscavige, they got $150 US dollars back in 1992. 120 150 US dollars for a handmade Egyptian cotton shirt and we were made to hand wash them for them because we couldn't use, put it in a machine that one shirt that he got was worth more than all the uniforms I would get in two years yeah but you had a senior position too you were what was your well, I took luxuries. I mean, after they left the base, I always made sure there was enough good food left over for me and some of my people in the messenger organization too. I mean, we act like kings as well, so we like them coming down. Because after they left, who gets the spoils of war? We do. Yeah, we got went off and finished off that big shopping that we did. It was so tragic for us if the executives had to leave early because all that great food and stuff. I mean, we dreamed about food like this. You get what you're eating in the seal. If we put them on beans and rice at the flag land base to teach them a lesson. I mean, I'm not talking beans and rice for dinner. I'm talking beans and rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Okay. And they tried to go off to the canteen to buy food. We posted security guards to prevent them from buying other food because otherwise the punishment wasn't being enforced right. and understood by the staff member. Right. So were you guys on beans and rice at the same time? No, well, actually, sometimes we were, yeah. But sometimes you weren't? No, sometimes we got away with it, yeah. Because technically we weren't part of the flag land base. We were messengers. And over in Los Angeles as well. Um, 
we'd find ways to get around it. I mean, the messengers are a power unto their own. They're a law unto themselves. They're not answerable to anybody. If we really wanted to get around something, we could do that. Yeah. I mean, the idea is we looked at management like chalk and cheese. Management and Scientologists are the scum that we have to deal with, and frankly, any bullshit that they give us is an inconvenience to us. You know, we're the messengers. We're authorized by policy to do anything we want. You can't stop us. There's nothing you can do. So everything that went wrong in management was looked at not as a responsibility, but as, uh, oh, God, here we go again. Got to fix this. Yeah. And I look at a staff list, and I see names. I don't see humans. I see names. I don't look. I don't look at a person's file and see a human being and his horrible experience as a child or what happened to him. I look and go, Christ, is he going to fall apart if I put him on that post? My consideration isn't to fix him. My consideration is, can I use him? Right. Is he good enough for what I want? Is he robust enough? Is he turned off enough so that he can put up with this position I'm going to give him? Care of staff members. Sorry, we have an ethics office. We don't have a chaplain. There is nobody to go grieve to. You grieve to the ethics officer. I was the ethics officer. And the solution is always the same. You did something wrong. You're the cause of your demise. And you're wasting my time. Get out. And then after that, if he still misbehaves, Christ, I can we'll give him a committee of evidence. We'll give him a declare. These are extreme. To go declaring a person is an extreme action. You're cutting them all off from everybody he knows. Yeah. And what concerns me is that we've got people out there uh, who have had positions similar to mine within the C organization, within the church, such as Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder. And I'm not understanding why they keep coming forward with these statements, I'm a victim. They were the aggressors. Yep. Everyone's a victim. If you really want to go down to that level, we're all victims, you know. But hang on, we're talking about thousands of people worldwide and stories coming out from all levels, and apparently no one's doing it. It's just all a magic trick. I'm sorry, but Marty Rathbun and Mike Grinder are totally responsible. They stood by and watched while they instructed their HCR communication officers to do these things to their own staff, to deny them liberties, to deny them days off. This is not a crime. Basic fundamental human rights in a civilized society say you get medical treatment, you have the right to work some certain hours, you should enjoy life, you should do other activities. And Mike Rinder, as the commanding officer of the Office of Special Affairs, denied these rights to his staff. Marty Rathburn, as the Inspector General for Ethics, just stood by while the technology was changed and gave his big rubber stamp. Technology changed? Yeah. There's a project set up years ago in Scientology to change it because it was realised that Ron Hubbard had said some pretty far out things. Yeah. It was coming under scrutiny. The book all about radiation contained clear falsehoods. A lot of his books did. They had to be fixed to make Scientology credible. So, slowly change the policy letters. L. Ron Hubbard becomes a trademark, not a human being. So who was in charge of that project then? Don't know who was in charge of the project. It was a general fundamental agreement. But Marty Rathburn himself, as the Inspector General for Technology, signed off on these things. He stood by and allowed this to actually go. My messenger organisation that I was part of had the Office of the Senior case supervisor international yeah rubber stamp change it change it change it i mean all these books and things that have come out and you, and all the technology has been changed what what you're being asked to believe here is that ron hubbard himself at the saint hill special briefing course which included all materials on scientology himself was a squirrel his own technology that he delivered to personally supervised to hundreds of people, thousands, was all wrong. 
And somehow he just didn't even look at his own dictionary. He didn't even look at his own policy lens. Yet he was teaching it for years. This is the epitome of utter ridiculousness. That at the start of every course in Scientology and in the Sea Org, there is keeping Scientology working, which says any alteration to the tech. But David Miscavige and people like Marty Rathbun said, oh, but, you know, we found a new document that says that Ron Hubbard really meant this. Well, where's the document? And when finally people asked on OT level saying, excuse me, but did Ron really say this? It took him about a decade to finally come out with the handwritten L. Ron Hubbard pages. Well, do you really believe they came from Ron? Why did it take 10 years to get them out? Yep. It takes a long time to, to write somebody's handwriting if you're good enough. Yep. So tell me, um, what did what was your procedure or how, how were um, critics handled? How were critics critics viewed? Um, no, threats to the church. What was your procedure on handling them or dealing with them? There's a specific procedure. The procedure is when you've got this critic, he's gotten the information from somewhere to come and attack. Where did he get that information from? And once you've identified the, the source of that, and it's always a human being, okay, find out a way to discredit them. Now people talk about um, on the internet and on boards and in books that Scientology, uh, or not Scientology, but the management of Scientology uh, manipulate information. Well, here's the big shock to everyone out there that's looking at this, is that thing you call a, pr a priest penitent privileged file is not privileged. True, the auditor per person auditing you and your case supervisor above that auditor are probably never going to discuss those details. Most of them are very good like that. They wouldn't violate that sacred trust. The trust is only entrusted to them. I can still, as a messenger, <laughs> walk into the folder room and grab anyone's PC file and read it. Mm. And that's exactly what I did. I can look in their file and see, right, this person has admitted when he was seven year olds to having a dog lick his <coughs> genitals. He's admitted to having sex with a woman that was legally underage. Oh, I've got this boy now. Now, how do I get that information out of his file into the public domain? There's several solutions to it. First solution is I can get him to admit it. Oh, how on earth would you do that? You approach him and you sit him down and you say, look, um, we're going to put you through a security check, okay? This is just to clear up everything, make everything in order, and then we're going we're gonna to clear you and we're going to give you a new post. Okay, the guy goes, oh, cool. Sit him down, security check questions. He sits down. He's not in an auditing session anymore. And the auditor says, still an auditor, but not doing an auditing session. So, have you had, ever had sex with someone who's underage? And the guy thinks, oh, well, yeah, you know the answer to that. And the auditor goes, no, we know, but we're just doing this to, you have to answer the question so it's still security check for your qualifications. The guy goes, yeah, I have. I mean, I did this, blah, blah, but you know about that. And the guy goes, thank you very much. Gotcha. <laughs> We've got it now. Now we're entitled legally to put that out in the public domain because we're morally conscious of society's needs to know these things. And so how many people knew about this w where you're working? Like how many people were aware of this? Everybody in CMO or? I would say the top, the commanding officers of CMOs, no. The deputy commanding officers, no. And the HCO area secretaries, no. The other staff, to a mild extent, I mean they were familiar because they would often see the end results of, of a smear campaign against a staff member. And it's quite horrible for a staff member. He's gone and admitted to all these things in his life and then he gets out of line and you decide to do a committee of evidence and now you splatter all these personal details on a committee of evidence and it's on the staff notice board. And the guy feels that big. You're talking about his perverted sexual behaviour. Oh my God, you've just you've destroyed this guy's reputation. To the very people he works with every day, of course he's going to bow down and, and be a dog to you now. And what about those that don't bow down? What happened? What do you do to them? What did you do to them? The ones that kept fighting or the ones that kept... Oh, they were troublesome. We had, I mean, 
people that didn't comply were just annoying. I'm not, you know, just... Ugh, another one that's got a free mind. Christ, why question it? What's, it's not going to change anything. If you keep questioning it, we've got the, we've got the rehabilitation project force. We've got the, the penal colony we can put you in. That, the threat of that alone, enough, is enough to terrify people to not do it. To sit back and go, well, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, all right, yeah, okay, it was out of ethics for me to say that, okay. Because the fear, the idea that you could go into that environment is horrible. Now, if they were beyond even that, we're talking about a very free-minded person. The only other solution is kick them out. And once they're out of the seal, you've got to cut them off from Scientology. How do you do that? You enforce an order, which we enforce all throughout Los Angeles, that if you were an ex-Scientologist, one, you could never be a staff member of another organization. You mean an ex seal member? Yeah, you can never be a staff member of a normal Scientology organization. And if you joined up to a Scientology-run business, you had to sign a paper that said, I do intend to rejoin the Sea Org at one day. And then you'd have to pay a freeloader bill first and foremost from the Sea Org. I mean, you're trapped. You're just caught. Now, you've got guys in there for five six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. They don't know anybody else in life other than Scientologists or SEAL members. Yeah. You put them out on the street, they've got nowhere to go. The fear alone of that is enough to keep you in there. So what about these crazy interrogations? There are no crazy interrogations. No, I mean the, the things that you referred to as a brain fry. Okay. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, you've got a, a procedure in the seal called rollback, and it's an informal interview that can be done with another person. It's not auditing, it's not a security check, but you have free reign of terror over what questions you can ask a person. Which means you don't have to follow the auditor's code. Who who put out this issue on rollback? Ron Hubbard. Okay, yep, yeah, carry on. And you can sit there with a person and ask them any question per se on the fly, ask them anything, talk to them, but they're holding the e-meter cans, you're reading the meter and talking to them, so you're justified in asking anything, guy says to you, oh, yeah, I, I heard that Scientology was, was, uh, was into money laundering, where did you hear that, oh, from Desmond Harris, oh, who's Desmond Harris? Oh, he's this guy, and did he, is he a Scientologist? Would he know anything? No, well, why do you listen to this guy? The guy goes, well, because he's a friend. What made him a friend if he's not helping you in Scientology? And, it is, and the beration goes right from there on, and it can increase to anything. There's nothing you can't be asked for in those interviews. The end goal of the interview? A guy walking out of it who no longer complains. That's the end goal. And hopefully he hates the source of information that he got it from in the first place. So enough to disconnect from it. And then you've really got him. No, he's really with you. Rollback is one of the most evil techniques. I've read the HCO uh, bulletins on it, and they're very selected people that can read these. I don't know why I was privy to them. I shouldn't have been. I didn't have the training for it. But this is just nasty stuff. Ron Hubbard's talking about how to confuse the human being and take that confusion and get it directed towards another target. Anything to get you off Scientology track attack. Here's, a, here's an example, the IRS case. The SEAL campaign launch was showing the number of human rights violations by the IRS, beating up this person, violating the law on this person, some deaths involved, right? You yep. recall this? Yep, yep, yep. The moment the IRS gave us our little tax-free stamp, that's it, we left them alone. And I asked uh, a long-term Scientologist, uh, Director of Special Affairs, I said, uh, did we fix what happened with the IRS? And he said, yeah, we got our tax-free stamp. So I went, no, no, I don't mean that. I mean, did they stop hurting people? And he goes, what? I said, our, our whole campaign for years was about the IRS hurting people. Did they stop it? Did we find out if they stopped doing that? Why would we be, we just got our tax exempt status? Said, yeah, don't you see the point? We were never in it to correct 
their out efforts. We were only ever in it to get our stamp. Once we got the stamp, we walked away from them and let them do whatever they wanted. We didn't care anymore. Did you kill the guy? I don't give a shit anymore. Who cares? We've got a tax exempt status. But that's not the epitome of of uh, of hypocrisy. I don't know what it is. Yeah. How inhumane can you get? We're going to drop the... So we were we were helping these people to fight the IRS. The moment we got the IRS stamp, we dumped them. You're on your own now. So can't help you. IRS is on our side now. See you later. Bye-bye. We've just destroyed your life. We made you write that confession in the paper on the IRS. We made you go public with it. We told you we were going to help you. Bye-bye. Oh, so that was part of the strategy. It wasn't just, say, the blackmail of the people that had control of the IS, IRS, but also you used... We used other... their victims. Yeah, got it. And once they were there, left out, hung out to dry, the church just walked away from them. Because we got what we wanted. We got that We got that tax exempt status. Right. And that's the mentality of the SEAL organization. How do we get it? It's not just one man. And it's not all of them. I mean, you've got this guy, he's a SEAL member, he's working in central files. He's filing, he's writing letters, he's doing his little part for king and country. He doesn't understand that he's just another part of this machine that is geared towards production at all costs. The moment anything interrupts that production, it's extracted like a bad tooth. Staff members, all SEAL members that are leave are left. L. Ron Hubbard told us to call them degraded beings. Now, people like Marty and Mike and many of these executives out there were the very people that were on TV telling you how great it all was and how all these people are, are, are dickheads yep. and liars. Yep. And now they're out. What does it tell you? Not only did they not buy it, they don't want to buy it anymore. They know what they did. They helped to create that and they should be sorry for it. And they should do something about it. And standing in front of a camera saying, Dad and Scatter stepped me on the wrist, is not a confession of what you did, Marty Rathburn, sitting on that ship. What eating, do you mean, sitting eating, on the ship? Eating, in a, eating five star meals on a ship by a five star French chef in the Caribbean. Oh, you poor soul. I feel so sorry for you that you get your own private cabin while the other SEAL members are stacked three high in rooms small enough for one human being and we stack them nine high enough. And you want me to feel sorry for you because you got slapped? You, you deserve that and a lot more, pal. You know, because by the end of the day, you were just happy to accept your lot. You thought you had some inalienable right to be better than other human beings. You're not talking about that, Mr. Rathburn. You're not talking about the fact that you had a private steward that came to your table and groveled and asked you what you wanted to eat and got it for you. You're not talking about the fact that you had chauffeurs. These are luxuries, even for regular human beings. And the regular SEAL member looks upon you as a god and you abuse your privilege. You know, these guys give up 14 hours of their life every day and go sometimes for years without a single day off and they take one step, one foot wrong and, and they're treated like garbage. And then if they dare leave, they're called a degraded being by Ron Hubbard himself. He told us to call them degraded beings. Ron, who said, if you join the SEAL, you are one of the greatest people in the universe. And then after you join, he says, you leave. You dare leave. You're a degraded being. How do you reconcile that? How are you supposed to leave? You don't, you're not told that when you join the SEAL. Oh, by the way, if you leave, you're going to be labelled a degraded being. Not by me, by Ron Hubbard. Yeah. You're a degraded being. Call me a degraded human. How, how dare you? I gave my life to you people. I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was saving mankind based off of the premise that you presented to me. And you sold me a lie. And then I went around selling that lie knowing it was a lie. And that's the difference between a victim and an aggressor. 
And these people that are the aggressors, like me, that did ask you to abort, did ask you to walk away from your wife, your children, put your child in a cadet organization and thump them full of Scientology for 13 years, and then when I thought the picking was right, I'd take him out and put him in the messenger organization and put him through a bunch of drills that told him how to get compliance. I didn't give him sex education. I didn't teach him the history of Earth. I didn't teach him literature or the fine works of Shakespeare or Frank Herbert or Orson Welles. I didn't get him to read Moby Dick. No, I got him to read Mission Earth, which is full of perverted sexual acts. And then I go and tell him, can't have perversion. Don't listen to your brain. Don't listen to your instincts. Don't have friends. If you have friends, you might have to comment them one day. So what do you do? Don't have friends. You have the facade of friendship in the scene. Because at the end of the day, you can know these guys, and then all of a sudden, you're in trouble. Boom, they don't want to know you. Is that a friendship? What kind of a family is that? Mm. You know, and then you get these dysfunctional people walking away from the Sea Org, and people say, well, you're crazy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but who's the crazy one? Me for being there, or for you for not helping me to stop it? So these kids that you got for the CMO, that you recruited for CMO, um, how old were they when you recruited them? Typically 13, 14. We didn't like them too much older than that. Why? Because they started to develop their own instincts. At 15, the guy's fully into thinking about sex, women going out, drinking, um, perhaps even, dare I say it, listening to music. Well, at 13, you can cut him off on that, because this is where he starts to develop what is pleasure to him. This is as he starts to take the shape of a young man or a young woman. Yeah. That's the perfect time to get him. What's pleasure? Pleasure is getting compliance. Pleasure is having people do what you tell them. Pleasure is being rewarded for an up statistic. You, you're literally taking their instincts and you're, you're, you're actually changing the way their brain works. You do this long enough, it's the Pavlov dog. Yep. Okay? Ring the bell, he knows it's dinner time. And the seal, ring the bell, you know you're going to get comment. You know what to do. Comply, 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 comply. And the irony is that the prison's just out here in your mind. It's the same prison, though, for a civilian going along on a road, driving at 60 kilometers an hour. He has a choice. Do I dare go to 80 kilometers an hour? Well, well, he can if he wants to. But how would you like to be in a place that knew every time you drove at 80 kilometers an hour? You couldn't get away with it once. How would you feel then? As a, as a civilian here in society, imagine if your government or council knew every thought you had. Every time they put a black box on your car and you, every time you drove over the speed limit, gave you a ticket, gave you a ticket, gave you a ticket. They knew every time that you had too much to drink and charged you with intoxication, even if you're in your own house. Welcome to the world of the Sea Org, if you let it go on. That's the world you're looking at. Come in for your weekly sick check. You drank too much, you were sick. Ethics condition. That's the world you're going to get. Orson Welles, 1984, take a back step. This is something even greater than that. We're talking about not only controlling your actions, We've taken it back to the step of not only controlling your thoughts, but we've taken it back to preventing you from being able to generate that thought. That's a terrifying world. Yeah. If you dare let the sea all expand, anybody stands by and lets it get to that point, you have no one to blame for yourself but something that will make communism look like a like Bob Sideshow. We are talking about ultimate control. I can line up 100 SEAL members and ask them a question and I'll get an identical answer. Because that's what they're told to think. Yeah. The Scientology work, yes, 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 yes. Have you had ones? Yes, 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 yes. What do you think about psychiatry? Bad, 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 bad. What do you think about heavy petting before marriage? No, 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 no. Clones. They do have personalities down there somewhere, but personality requires a means of expression. If you take that away, sorry, that's not an L. Ron Hubbard photo on your wall, replace it. Where did you get that quote from? Oh, from this book on this 
replace it with our own hubbin. You're going to get not just you're not just going to get robots. Okay, robots is a, is a mild thing. You're going to get something worse, a human being that still computes but will only compute on what it's told to. That's worse than a robot because a robot is has predefined parameters. But you're getting a free thinking robot. That's terrifying. You want the world to be like the seal? You don't think it's going to expand? Guess what? That's not what they think. Because within the society there is a certain individual that you can get. He was always the high school bully. He still wants to be the bully. And when you hire him and you recruit him, like I did, I love them. Make him a bully. Give him Tyrone Webb, small little kid, laughed at, had a big head on his shoulders, literally a big head for his body, laughed at, get even, be a messenger, tell them what to do, they'll be scared, they'll be scared, and guess what, he loved him, little Tyrone Webb, I trained him up, and there he goes, and now he's there doing the same thing to human beings. Yep. Yelling, screaming, intimidation. Why? Is he an evil kid? It's just that I took away the parts that allowed him to be free. And I augmented that little trait there. That poor, poor little kid had that little thing about him, about being dominated, and he didn't like it. So I gave him a solution. I said, if you're dominated, dominate others and Seal will continue to grow and win if you allow this horrendous policy to exist that can train people to be like this as human beings because when you talk to a Seal member and you ask him are you happy being in the Seal and he says yes I am try to understand something he means he is happy okay he is mm -hmm. because that's the way he's programmed if you put a dog into a kennel this big and that's all the dog knows it learns to become happy with that environment. This is why we have human rights, acceptable standards of living. The Sea Org takes these children that have already been in the Sea Org. They already live in bunks at the age of three years old. This is what they are used to. They're used to not seeing family. They're used to not... You're not giving them something different. You're giving them the same. And then when this kid grows up and becomes like David Miscavige, leader of the Sea Org, and you say to him, oh, it's inhumane to live in a bunk. No, it's not. He, he wouldn't know what it was like not to. Mm. So, if that's the way you want the world to go, just let the seal grow. Do nothing. Sit back. That's Scientologist. How many affidavits are out there? How many people are screaming? You know? Yes, I believe in religious freedom. I believe this guy has a right to be a Muslim. I believe this guy has a right to be a Catholic. This is not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about their actions. I'm sick and tired of the Church of Scientology International putting forward their creed. Okay, but this is what we write, but it's not what we do. Yeah. You know, here's the difference. A Catholic priest rapes a child. The Church itself finds this disturbing and does want that priest to be punished. They do. They don't want their priests to rape. The difference in the Sea Org is that they do want that priest to imprison your mind. We do want control and compliance. We do want you to go to this penal colony. We do want to assign you conditions. We do want to put a head on a pike each week and RPF somebody and hurt them. We do. This is our policy. And they're lying because the church, the Catholic church says, this is the Bible. It's happy if you preach the Bible. But in Scientology, the creed, you may not apply the creed and you may not apply the tech when you're a member of the Sea Org. You cannot because the policies clearly contradict everything that Scientology stands for. And that is a fraud. It's a lie. And the fact that you can have these people do this to other human beings and not consider consequence like I did is proof enough 
that there is something intrinsically and wrong in the systemic creation of the organization in the first place. Got it. How could I do these things? How could I ask a woman to kill an unborn baby? How could I take this woman and send her away from her child and send her to Europe for two years and not allow any phone calls back to their family? How did I take all these people in the Hollywood Guaranteed Building and tell them family time is cancelled because you're a down statistic? This is the very church that preaches family values, that breeds, that talks about creation of a great society. Oh, I'm sorry. You must be you must be talking about something else because I haven't seen it. And every sealed member, I I know a great idea right now. Get every sealed member in the world right now to do an affidavit about how they feel about it. Go check on them in ten years. I guarantee you, eighty percent of them will have left and have been declared. Yep. I guarantee it. I'll stake my life on it. I was one of those. So I would have fought you to the hell come home. I disconnected even from my own family to be the best messenger I could be. I sent my own brother to the rehabilitation force and to the penal colony for having thoughts and for having touched a woman. Now, if that's not a monster, then please tell me what is. Got it. Hey, thanks, matey. Thanks for listening. Not a lot of people do. No. Good to have the info. I'd like some other people to come forward. I'd like some other people that were in positions similar to mine to admit that we just weren't victims. We did things. We did ask for those things to be done to other staff. And we did them. Got it. And be responsible for their actions. Even if it means admitting that they were monsters. Because deep down, none of us were. We thought we were doing something right. And you were part of that machine. Yeah. Created by the machine. I was created by the machine and then I went off to create more. And I'm really sorry to those people that I got in there and I created them. Because I've run into a couple in the field after I've left and I'm saddened to see how they've turned out as human beings. Because there's almost nothing human left in them. Just n- almost nothing there, just compliance, and it's like a 24-hour police officer with no with no heart, and stay there too long, and I don't know how. I still haven't been rehabilitated. I still have trouble. I still have nightmares. I still think about things that happen there. I have dreams of being dominated and dominating, and I still have that switch in my mind I can turn off. And I want it to go. I don't like being like that. Mm. You know, I want my emotions to be real. But it's really hard to have real emotions when they were forbidden for six years. Yeah, especially at that time, when you were so young, 15 to 22 or something. Those were my formative years as a human being. It's where, it's where humans find out what they want to do in life and go off and explore and start careers. I, my career was to hurt you, and I enjoyed it, and I'm sickened that I did. Mm. But back then I wasn't, but now it's really hard to reconcile that other human being I see in my dreams or sometimes coming out in an argument or a debate with some other person. He just jumps out there and I look at him and I go, Aaron, how can you look at yourself and think of yourself as two people? You're clearly the same person. The question I've got for myself is, am I a good person that went bad? Or was I always just a bad bastard that just was given the chance to be even worse? Which one is it? And if I'm even asking myself the question, then I need help. Mm. I'm not the only one out there having that same question. You know, Marty and Mike, Tom DeVott. I know we had good times in the SEAL. I worked with these people. We had great times. We had fun. But take a step back and look at what you did. You created an atmosphere of fear and loathing and and family separations and you destroyed all family values and and all those things that make us human that got us to this great part of life that we know artistic singing 
loving, dancing, music, all these things that make us human, we, we, we stripped them from people around us and we made it okay to be less than human. I need, I need those people to come forward and talk and admit that it's okay to talk about it. It's not okay you ever did it. Nothing will ever make it okay, pal. Sorry, nothing ever will. If you can't live with that, then I suggest you reflect on yourself and ask yourself, what is a human being? What is a conscience? And what is morality, really? Mm. There's an answer there. You might not. You might have. You might have a, a couple of tears shed when you find out you shouldn't have done these things. And you'll have an even bigger tear when you find out that you enjoy that. And you might look at yourself and want to kill yourself for it and end your life because of what you put other people through. You don't have to do that. You just have to stop it being done to others now. So step forward. Talk. If you lose your... If you're in a Scientologist and you're in good standing and you have the potential to lose them, understand one thing. The seal was promising heaven when in reality we're all going to hell according to them and all your mates will be there. If you have to disconnect now to make your stand and be heard, then do it. One day, down the road, your friends will come and join you here. Because we're all on the same side of the fence. It's just someone else telling you that we're not. Got it. Hey, mate, thanks for your honesty. All right, thank you. Cheers. Um, since I launched my YouTube videos, um, I've had a lot of uh, people send me messages about their experience in the seal. Um, some public Scientologists have made a comment and I'm getting mostly agreement that what I'm saying is true but there are people that are conveying to me that um, when they were in the seal that wasn't their experience they thought that it was more freer than that they, they're telling me you said Aaron that we couldn't listen to music and I'm getting emails back saying well we could listen to music yeah. okay and I just want to point out that, yes, I've painted this picture of, of the seal, which is quite dark. And then, but try to understand something. I was in the Hubbard Communications Office, and this staff member might have just been in Division 4 and just been doing fine for two years without much harassment. This is quite possible. I don't doubt it at all. But um, I think you'll find in general, over, all in all, that what I have said will hold true across the board here. because. Um, one person out of Division Four says, well, you know, once I saw a staff member get into so much trouble that they had something done to them. So in their minds, they're saying, well, I just saw it once. Well, I'd just like to point out that if you're at the Flag Land Base and there's a thousand staff there and you're closely working with 20 staff and you see it happen to one staff member, that's 50 staff that are going through that. And people in the Hubbard Communications Office are the ones that are always walking around the org seeing these things and putting these things together. And that's why HCO staff are always burning out because they're so exposed to this, the crap that goes on. You know? And you know, just to point out something about Scientology is that um, the trap of Scientology started from keeping Scientology working in Series 1. When you go to university, and you're sitting there and the lecturer goes, right, we're going to have a lecture, we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss a technology. After he's discussed it, there's a question and answer. There's a debate regarding this. There is a growth of it. Now, many sealed members, Scientologists and public, can't understand why in their minds, but the student hat worked for me. The touch assist worked for me. The word clearing worked for me. So how can somebody tell me it's a bunch of bull. Okay? There's two answers to that. Firstly, Scientology is the only religion in the world that asks you to defend something you don't know. When you start Scientology, you can't read the Bible all at the start. You can only read a bit of it, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. So constantly, Scientologists are defending something they just don't know. They don't know what OT3 is. They don't know what OT5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the same whole special brief. Of course, they don't know it, and yet they're defending it. And the reason why they're doing this is because in keeping Scientology working in Series 1, which is purported to be the saviour of Scientology, when in actual fact this policy matter is its death, 
This policy that it says from the word go, before you even know anything about Scientology, if you question it, you're against us. If you discuss it, you're against us. So you can read a policy there, but you're not permitted to discuss it with another human being because it's called verbal technology. And when Alan Hubbard is lecturing, he's not like a university lecture. There is no Q&A. It's just, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and you go through hours of this. I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. I'm talk don't answer. Don't, don't think. Don't ask me a question. I'm telling you, this is the way it is. And keeping Scientology working, right from the word go, the first guy that walks into Scientology is slowly getting indoctrinated. He reads this policy, it says, don't think about it. No verbal discussions. If you experience past lives, you can't talk about it. Well, no wonder, because it's all bullshit. No wonder you can't talk about it. If it really was past life and it was really real, then it would be just as real as something we're experiencing now. So what would the difference be? So the trap is right there in keeping Scientology working series one. From the word go, you read it, and it's the first thing you read in any course, in any training in Scientology, and it keeps reinforcing to you. Don't question what is written. Do not discuss what is written. Do not debate what is written. And eventually, after you do a couple of courses in Scientology, and even in the Sea Org, you can't talk about what you've just read. There is no questioning of it, because you know, according to Keeping Scientology Working, Series 1, that the moment you start to discuss it, it means that you do not 100% agree with it unequivocally. And therefore, according to that very same policy letter, you must have misunderstandings about it. And if you have misunderstandings about it, and you dare not clear those up, you're a suppressive person. But if there's something wrong with it, and you talk about it, if there's actually something wrong with the technology, you're also a suppressive person. There's only ever one answer. It's always right. And that trap is what gets them going. Here's the reality. Scientology was born in the 50s. It went and did some good things. And it did some bad things because misapplication of it is a shocking thing to do to another person. Okay? What happened is Elrond Hubbard got in trouble and he had to leave. And he went on a boat. In, 19, in the uh, mid 1960s, he went on a boat and created this thing called the Sea Organization. And he lost the plot. This is where he came up with his OT3 story, which, by the way, was a story written by Ron in 1953, I think, called Revolt in the Stars, which uh, Hollywood refused to issue as a film. It was written before then. You know, there's even a, a video where Alan Hubbard is talking about Xenu from the early 50s, and he supposedly found this in 1967. Anyways, what I'm saying is that what really happened is that when he was on the boat, he created an extremist organization. And when they landed back in America and took charge, the world was told, the SEAL is here to protect Scientology, and they are in charge of it. And everybody believed them. This is the lie. The SEAL, in actual fact, has got nothing to do with Scientology, has its own creeds, its own policies, and its own doctrines which they have nothing, they are not religious. And they hijacked Scientology and used Scientology as a method to accomplish their goals. So while you keep seeing people out there going, but the seal is protecting Scientology, it's the other way around. Scientology is the vehicle for the seal, not the seal being the vehicle for Scientology. And they use all these activities like applied scholastics, and Narconon. To the Sea Org, it's just another activity that's implementing their ultimate goals. Look, people want to believe that Scientology is all about money. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's far worse than that. It's not just about money. It's about control. Controlling your life, governments, and the way we live. And the Sea Org is just what they want in society on a small scale, and it's expanding. And when people realize that it's wrong to call Scientology a cult, it's not a cult. A cult is, by definition, a religion, a belief system, a godlike thing 
practices and belief that are considered unorthodox or extreme and often run or led by a charismatic leader. This is the definition of a cult. Scientology doesn't fit that definition. The church, the creed, sorry, that looks like a bona fide religion. The Sea Org, on the other hand, wearing uniforms, captains, commanders, lieutenants, chief petty officers, musters, standing out of tension, roll calls, living in barracks, cutting off all media, no TV, no newspapers, no books on anti-Scientology, no books on anti-anything, no books on psychiatry, no phone calls to the outside, no civilian contact in our offices. That is a cult. And when people finally dawn on the horrible truth that Scientology is not thankful to the SEAL for making it successful, but that Scientology is in control because a cult controls Scientology. And when you can make that differentiation, you can finally see it for what it is. This staff member in the local organization around here, this public Scientologist, this pretty average Joe Schmo guy, he wants to help. He really does. This is why we were all there. But what happens is when you join the C organization, it becomes ultimately complex, and you realize you are in a cult now. It's not an upgrade of a staff member. It's something different. It's not the next level from a staff member. It's something different. You are part of a cult. You have unorthodox training. You have unorthodox requests, unorthodox policies, unorthodox living conditions, weird rules, ceremonies that make no sense. The list is endless. That's your cult, and that's what we have to destroy. Because Scientology, the sea will keep using Scientology. Every time we attack Scientology, they keep going, you're a gay, you're a religious, intolerant person. Mm. The reality is, you should be targeting the sea org because they stand for everything that is a cult and nothing to do with religion. So when people say, attack Scientology, I say, let that guy out there think what he wants to think and believe. The target is the seal. They are the cult. They have the policies that actually instruct disconnection, RPFing people, and um, infiltrating enemy networks and everything to do with paranoia. This is not part of the average Scientologist. You can't tell me a thousand people doing a student hat would really be a disaster. But a thousand people being in the seal, doing a basic seal member hat, now that's a disaster. Do I think Scientology works? Not a chance. Not with keeping Scientology working series one, there or anything else for that matter, because the end result is it just doesn't work in the long run. Okay, you have to be in the Scientology environment for it to work, and even then, it's hairline, and it's all about beliefs and just what's what you're making up in your head, the art of self-delusion. So within an organisation of Scientology, perhaps it's got some workability, but let's step out to the real world and go out on the stockbroking market or, or go out to the local nightclub. It's got no application whatsoever, but within that group it does. But I want to reinforce here, the cult is the Sea Org. Get governments, write your senators, get your MPs, your members of parliament, look at the Sea Org. These are the people that are running the show. For Christ's sake, they're standing there with caps on, saluting a billion-year contract. Separate this bullshit. This is Scientology. It still doesn't work, but the real cult here is the SEAL and their practices and their horrific policies. And they're the ones that own the trademarks. They're the ones that own Scientology. They own the close scholastics. They own Arcanon. And they own over a hundred other entities that you seemingly think are innocent and they've got everything to do with control. And the show is over. And the show is only going to be over if people stand up now, put their name on a piece of paper, and send it into their local government. Stop talking about Scientology. Start talking about the Sea Organization. This is the target. These are the crazy, insane people. And understand, the beginning Sea Org members are just like staff members in a way. After a couple of years, though, they're goners.
They are goners. They don't live in a house, they live in a barracks. They don't have family, they have friends that can be there one day and gone the next. They don't have days off like you and I, or even a normal staff member. So please, the prosecution against Scientologists, yes, they still deserve it, but first target, get rid of this horrific, hyenas, above the law cult called the Sea Organization, which is running rings around governments right now. And they're so powerful, they own a 350-foot boat in the Caribbean called the Free Ones that they tell the world delivers Scientology, when in fact, the entire operation on the ship is funded out of donations, and its entire purpose is to ship money around the planet. And that's what it does. And that's how you can keep a 350-foot boat operating in the Caribbean. Don't tell me it's from services. The local org struggles enough on a, on a small income. Running a 350-foot ship does not happen on giving a couple of people a week a, a course on OT8. It's the headquarters of the IAS, the International Association of Scientologists, which is another activity controlled by the SEAL. So I invite you, write your MPs, talk about the SEAL now. I'm the SEAL organisation at the HGB in Los Angeles. Um, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I was there uh, in the Holy Guarantee Building. It's what it's called. It's owned by uh, the SEAL organisation or the Church of Scientology International. Mm -hmm. It's located at uh, 6331 Hollywood Boulevard. It's oh. pretty much the public face of management of the SEAL. And I was there in 90, late 92, 93, 94, 95, uh, early 96. Okay. So do the general public, or indeed even SEAL members, know the full scope of the operations there? I think they've got some idea of the scope, what happens there. I mean, from it would be interesting to know what people know and what they don't know. As an example, generally in the command channels of Scientology, the Hollywood Guarantee Building is seen to hold this middle management, the Flag Command Bureau, you know, which you have one section there, the Flag Bureau, which runs all the uh, uh, management offices around the world in the different continents. Mm -hmm. Then you have Wise International, Scientology Missions International, uh, ABLE International, the Office of Special Affairs International, uh, the International Training Organization, which then trains all the uh, administrators and all the different organizations around the planet. Mm -hmm. What I don't think people know, and I don't really know how relevant it is, um, but in that building there's 12 stories, and what a lot of people don't know is that this, this one building is very uh, important uh, to the operations internationally. Uh, not just because it holds what's known as middle management, but it represents an unusual situation uh, in the SEAL organization. As an example, up at uh, international level you have gold and what they call the Watchdog Committee, although it really is just Division 4A of CMO International. And over here you have the Executive Director International, located outside Riverside and the Herders Base and so forth. And it can seem that there's a lot of different organisations everywhere, but in reality they all stem through the Hollywood Guarantee Building. Any personnel going to international go through the Hollywood Guarantee Building. All communications from any organisation go to the Hollywood Guarantee Building, then they go out to another organisation or they go from there to international. In other words, the HGB is, is, is like a stem on a tree where we have Scientology below as the root system, the liaison offices, the orgs, the missions, and then it stems very sharply to the Hollywood Guarantee Building, and then from there it goes out up to international management. Um, some things that people may not know about the function of the Hollywood Guarantee Building. Uh, we all know it's got the other one having life exhibition at the bottom. Well, what a lot of people don't know is that there is a secret uh, LRH apartment, not an office, an LRH apartment on the 10th floor. And it's on the uh, northeast side of the building, northeast corner of the building, and it takes up almost one third to half of the entire floor space. Uh, this has been built on a slight, if that's the blueprint of the building, the offices have been built on a slight slant like this. And what happens is that the elevators open up on the floor and the most northern eastern, the most eastern uh, elevator actually 
doesn't open on the 10th floor unless you have a special key. Um, and what, what annoys me about this is that this apartment was built for Ron Hubbard, who's dead. And not only that, the cost of it is in the millions of dollars. Uh, we have a, a gigantic lounge there, um, a walk-in closet for him, a gigantic bedroom, uh, a, a walk-in shower. It's just laden with Italian marble. It's got some of Ron's personal possessions there, uh, such as his jumper that he wore in the same hill photo, um, some of his old razors, um, a closet full of clothes. They're not fakes, they're the real things. Um, the Italian marble alone is probably around about two, three hundred US dollars a square foot. I mean, it's some of the most expensive marble. You this is L. Ron Hubbard's apartment. It's not just his office. Uh, we have gold-plated cutlery. We have two-foot-wide candles. We have uh, animal furs, uh, ro uh, Roman-depicted sculptures across the top of his bed. Uh, and what annoys me about this is that the seal and Scientology keep crying poor. And I know for a fact that in 1996 we had over 1,000 million US dollars in the reserves figure. Okay, and I got that from the person who was in charge of reserves. Mm. Okay, that's how much cash they had. And this apartment had to have cost several million dollars to make. And no one ever used it. And we've got SEAL members sitting out there in rooms, okay, 10 foot by 10 foot, that are housing six to nine staff members, and they're told the money is better spent on 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 on, on building organisations and this and that and building up the war chest against these enemies of Scientology. And we've got this apartment built there. It's even got a messenger office where there are computers set up in case Ron comes back where these messengers can work. I mean this is utterly ridiculous. It's got a private kitchen. It's it's huge. Like, an apartment like this in Los Angeles would just cost millions for such a, for such a thing. That annoys me. Um, but away from that, and talking about the operations of the building, this is how it really works. The CMO, the Commodore's Messenger Org, at the building is known as the International Extension Unit, IXU. And they hold several departments that are very uncommon uh, to any other operation um, in the SEAL. Before I go into what those are, I just want to explain that. Your, your average staff member is sitting in his office doing his thing, and he sits there all day doing his thing. If he's an auditor, he's in the room. If he's a course director, he's in the, the course room. If he's in Division 2 in Central Files, he's over here. HCOs are always roaming. HCO staff are going everywhere all the time. They're in charge of all communications, personnel, and ethics. So they're always around, and HCO staff see everything. They are the police. And CMO is the police of management. In the CMO, there's no real boundaries. Everybody in CMO knows what the other messenger is doing. It's like an HCO. Mm -hmm. And even that has its own HCO, a Hubbard Communications Office, which polices the messengers themselves. But usually messengers don't require much policing. And it acts like one unit that thinks like one person and acts. That's why messengers get things done. Now. There are several departments, I was saying, that are in CMO that are not in any others. First of all, Flag Bureau is responsible for communications between organisations, and they handle the traffic of particles such as folders or what have you. Any information going to international management is what's known as the external communications of HCO in CMO. And we have a personal driver which drives up to international management with the package containing anything for international management, and it comes back. So CMO always knows everything that's going into management. And that's on the northeast of the building, outside the loading dock area, just inside there. That's where the um, CMO's communications are established, so they can quickly go outside and drive these particles off. Ironically, although he's a messenger with status, he actually wears a blue boiler suit and looks very much like a labourer. But in actual fact, he's in charge of the most important communications in existence. Everything going to international and back. So you wouldn't know. You would think he was a labourer. He's not. He's actually a very senior messenger with a very high security clearance. In fact, that person has the highest security clearance in all of CMO. Me, as the has, the HCO chief, above him, 
I didn't even have this security clearance. Because he has to go to locations like international archives with these materials, and no one can know where those are. Now, the other division of CMO that a lot of people don't know about is that every single communication by email and by telex goes through what's called the Authorization, Verification and Correction Unit, AVC. And that's located in CMO. The reason why it's located there is that while management have their instructions, it's only CMO that know whether or not those orders should really go out. And that's where they cut communications or alter communications or decide if those programs are inappropriate at that point in time. So the CMO is very much on the communication lines of the entire planet. The other department that they have is that uh, recently, back in 95, and it's probably still the case to this day, CMO was on the 10th floor with the L. Ron Hubbard office and the L. Ron Hubbard apartment. <laughs> then RTC decided to have an office there, so the messengers moved to the next floor down, and then RTC became established over there. And their offices were even more, or were not more expensive, but almost as labour intensive. Stainless steel and so forth, just ridiculous amount of money was spent establishing their offices, which by the way RTC didn't pay for as a corporate entity. Scientology International paid for it, which is actually illegal. Okay, RTC should have paid for it, but instead Church Scientology International Management paid for it. And all those offices there were set up. So now you've got the L. Ron Hubbard apartment plus the RTC office overtaking the uh, north. I said northeast before. The L. Ron Hubbard apartment is actually northwest, and the communications of CMO are northwest. The RTC office is northeast. So, sorry about that. Okay. Um, that's probably about it, and security is located beneath in the basement, along with all the files of the building that are considered valuable are kept in the basement down there, um, which are accessible as you walk in. You'll have a staircase at the end, one that goes up to International Training Hall, and the other staircase will lead you down to the basement where all security is maintained. Special files keep huge files. And that's where all secret confidential materials are disposed of, down there. It should be noted that that location down there also houses the entire library of all flag orders ever in existence. Every HCRB ever done, even the ones that other sealed members can't see, even the secret rollback, even the OSA network orders are actually kept downstairs. Okay, so the Mimeo, the people in charge of copying these are very carefully selected and their separate files kept for different, uh, the different specialised confidentiality. Um, also, that's where the giant shredder machine is, where we shredded the documents. I don't know how really interesting this information is, it's just somebody asked about the Hollywood Guarantee Building, and I wanted to tell them about it. In terms of security of the building, it's uh, not overly that fantastic. Obviously, the 10th floor has fairly substantial security on the windows, motion detectors, glass shattered detectors, um, and thermal detectors on the 10th floor. Above that is the Office of Special Affairs, which are completely cut off from the rest of the building. Uh, it should be probably made a point now that even messengers were not particularly permitted to go up to the Office of Special Affairs. Um, OSA International has and always will be run directly from RTC. Yes, we had a, an OSA program operator that ran programs in OSA, but these were mainly regarding establishment. Now, here's the interesting thing. Communications. Something people need to know. In normal organisations, communications are passed via the written document. In CMO, there's special training drills that get you to learn how to fundamentally learn an entire set of orders that could be pages in length. And these drills specially teach you, and it is a skill, to be able to convey these verbally without a single alteration. And you pass the drill when you can have 10 people, and you can pass a massive order of complexities through 10 different people, and at the end it gets there exactly how it started, with no alteration whatsoever. It's not a verbatim drill, that's the secret. 
It's the ability to identify the key points in the order and be able to convey them. Okay, it's not a debate and drill. Okay, and that's the secret of it. Because what happens when RTC orders Office of Special Affairs to find out this information, and then they ask CMO to get that information, and then they ask SMI International to do something, and ABLE International to do something, they seem just related activities. But it will all come together when a verbal order is given by RTC, and all RTC staff members are messengers. You cannot be an RTC before you're a messenger. When it comes time for the verbal order, that's when messengers visit, that's when phone calls are made, and the orders are conveyed, and it's known that they'll be carried out because of the verbatim drilling. That's not verbatim. So David Miscavish can call up and say, right, go to uh, Scientology Missions International, grab this folder, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and then give it to Oster International, who's then going to give it to a PI and do this, this, and 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 this is the out desired outcome, blah, 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 and on and on it goes. That messenger can take that and convey it precisely and get it done. And that's the value of messengers, to carry out not written orders, verbal orders. So although there's a policy in the sealed saying no verbal orders, mm. it's a total contradiction. David Miscavige walks around giving verbal orders non-stop, and so does Mark, uh, Ingo, Mark Yeager, and all these other characters, but they are carried out by messengers. And this is where people who are trying to intercept communications fail, because all they see is telex traffic. All they see is this disorder and this order going there. They don't see any thing that would ever prove anything, and that's because these orders are verbal. Often this is why missions are sent out to orgs. Not necessarily just to deal with some mission orders, but to convey a slew of orders that need to be followed in that organisation that they will not put on normal standard traffic lines. So this gives you a better idea of the importance of the HGV. Fundamentally it's a weakness in the seal because if staff keep disappearing from the Hollywood Guarantee Building, you have to bring people up from continental liaison offices. And once they get there, they have to go through training programs that can take 6 to 12 months to get them to really work properly. The only other solution, if there's a max exodus out of the middle management, is to get staff from international. We don't like doing that in there. Sorry, see, we don't like that. See, back then we didn't like doing that because the staff up at International have years of experience, they're thoroughly indoctrinated, and once they're brought out of the International base and into the Hollywood Guarantee Building, there's always a risk that they can get exposed to media, to life, to seeing cars and traffic, music and so forth. So International Management really hated sending staff down because they would often lose them. So any attack on the seal, the Hollywood Guarantee building is a pivotal point because it takes so long to replace the staff. It's not like attacking the Flagland Base or Celebrity Centre or AO or CLO, Continental Liaison Office. It's the Hollywood Guarantee building that holds the key. When that falls apart, trouble occurs on a worldwide scale because international management find it very hard to run the organisations directly. That's what the Hollywood Guarantee building is there for. Is there for is to basically diversify the traffic. Good. Yeah. Okay. So I hope that helps. I hope that gives some information that may not have been known before. Thanks so much. Any help at all it is? Yeah. Yeah, hi. This is a uh, message out there to people uh, in regards to Scientology and medical treatments. Okay. And I'm going to start off by talking about uh, one particular matter. And that is, I'm a little upset about the recent statement from the church about the fact that they don't deny medical treatments to people. Okay, we both, we both, you and me, whoever is watching this, know this is not true. And some time ago, uh, John Travolta's son died, and certainly it wouldn't be right for anybody to blame Scientology for that. And that would be a disgusting thing to do. But there is something important here. Okay. His son, according to what I've read, probably suffered from autism. And it was treatable, at least, to prevent the seizures from happening. Now, we, we all know the viewpoint 
of the sea organization and Scientology on drugs of any kind whatsoever that they're not to be taken we know this now the church comes keeps coming out and saying oh we don't deny anyone to have uh, medical treatment we don't deny that you should have medical treatment we all know this is a blatant lie and it's costing people's lives this is a message to John Travolta about your son and other people that are dying because people like you are defending this religion and you have to take responsibility for their deaths. I'm not talking about your son anymore. I'm talking about other people's deaths because you purport that this religion has the answers. Now, this is not true. Amanda Fletcher, staff member that I knew, a lovely lady, died of cancer. Sparshot died of cancer. A friend of my family's just this year, Scientologist, died of cancer, breast cancer that was treatable and she could have lived. Okay? I myself, in the Sea Organization, had a medical condition. And rather than allow me to take drugs of any kind that might have helped me, okay, they insisted that it was all in my head, that it was spiritual, and that I get uh, an auditing program that was utterly ridiculous, that had me saying hello to my kidneys, and then having my kidneys say hello to me. Me saying hello to my liver, my liver saying hello to me. This is ridiculous. It's utterly ridiculous to label, to label all the drugs in the world as being completely destructive to a human body, okay, when they're not. They help. These cancers, these conditions can be assisted sometimes by drugs. I'm not condoning all psychiatric drugs, but the very attitude of the Sea Organ Scientology to deny people these drugs, I want you to listen. Okay, they have flag orders and policies about using boot polish. They have flag orders about how to clean your desk. They have policies about how to clean your office, how to eat dinner, how to address a senior officer. Okay, if they really cared, where are the policy letters telling us each year go get your pap smear test if you're a female? That doesn't exist. Where's the policy letter that says what to do for staff medical treatments? There is none. Is there any policy that says, right, staff are to get a medical checkup once per year? There is none. Is there any medical program provided to staff? There is none. They don't want people to have medical treatment. That's the bottom line. And it's the same with Scientologists. They lie because guess what? Dead bodies can't tell you you're wrong. But their friends can. I've, I've lost people that I know in the last several years in Scientology that could have been saved if they had seen a medical practitioner. If I hadn't have seen a medical practitioner when I was 17, I'd be dead right now. And the only reason I saw that medical practitioner is because my mother dragged me off out of the Sea Org in Australia when I was 17 to go to the doctors. I would have been dead if she hadn't have done that. She was threatened with ethics action for taking me outside the organization. They were so glad that she did later on because I would have been dead. Now we've got this Liska, friend of the family here in New Zealand, breast cancer. She tried to handle it through auditing. She tried to handle it through reading more books on by Aaron Hubbard. Scientology does not fix the body. We have this purification rundown, okay? That's not scientifically proven. L. Ron Hubbard had this rundown. There was a surgeon's general warning on the, on the dangers of cigarettes, the 3,000 chemicals that they contained. And yet there was no policy about not smoking during the purification rundown. Yet it's one of the most toxic things you could take during a so-called purification rundown. L. Ron Hubbard himself was smoking. There is no scientific evidence behind these claims. It doesn't exist. And it's a lie. And for every Scientologist that stands out there and stands up for the text saying it can fix things which it cannot, more people are going to die. SEAL members. They don't have medical examinations. Some of them right now as we speak are dying of cancers that can be cured. We have people losing their eyesight. They're not getting medical treatment. And as long as every other Scientologist out there stands up 
for Scientology to be able to cure the incurable, it's going to kill people. This purification run has never been tested. You don't know what effect it has on your kidneys. You have no idea what it's doing to your liver. You have no idea because they will only say there are the results based off of what? Somebody finishing a purification rundown. But what evidence is that of what? Has there been any 10, 20 year study to show what the effects are of this program on their body as time goes by? No, there is no such program. The, the real truth is, even if you are a spirit, you still have a body. You can't chop, you can't chop a leg off a body and think that it can still run. And if you take it down to a microscopic level, we have this thing called the brain that does things for our body and if the brain is damaged the body can't work and no auditing is going to fix it and this complacency by Scientologists out there, celebrity Scientologists that allow this religion to be pushed are sitting back there with the luxury of being able to take these medical treatments other Scientologists would rather spend their money spending eight hundred dollars on some little communication course than going to see a doctor and it's disgusting. I'm not going to stand for it. And people like Tom Cruise that sit up there and lecture away because all the materials he's ever read about psychiatry and psych drugs is fed to him by David Miscavige is disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting and I know a lot of people out there agree with me. And I believe that you as celebrities that push this religion out there and make it popular are pushing something dangerous that you don't know about and I think it's time that any celebrity out there that's involved in Scientology take a step back and understand you have a responsibility for the message you put out there and the message you're putting out there is that this thing can solve problems in life solutions to all your problems in life it's not true you know John you lost your son Jet OT8 is not going to bring your son back. I know that sounds harsh, but it's just true. You think any OT level is ever going to make you happy as your son did? No. And this is the point. In the C organization, in Scientology, we don't have policy letters about celebrating the person moving on from, the ch from a position in the church to something else. We only have justice and ethics because they're leaving the group. We don't have policies on baby showers. We don't have policies on anything that are really about happiness. There's no policy letter on what to do when it's a person's birthday. There's no policy letter on going to see medical examiners. Nothing. Take a look at what isn't there. Because somebody from the church saying we don't object to medical treatment is an utter lie and we all know it's a lie. And to label all medical treatment under the guise of psychiatry is absolutely criminal. Criminal negligence and it's costing people's lives. I could feel bad for the loss of your son, but you know what? I'm dealing with the fact that just close friends of mine right now are dead because it was unpopular to go get a pap smear or check for breast cancer because some process in Scientology was going to fix it. Did you not, and I want to know John, did you, did you deny your own son treatments? Did you deny him the proper level of drugs that could have stopped his seizure? Because he had a different brain, because he was born different. And he gets categorized as, as a thetan that has to be treated the same way as everyone else. I mean, it's just not true. I think celebrities out there in, in Scientology must take responsibility for the message they're pushing. And the message that you're pushing is Scientology works. And guess what? It doesn't. It doesn't fix everything in life. And that's the ultimate goal of Scientology and the C organization, is to throw everything that's medical out the window and replace it with auditing. It's disgusting. It's costing people's lives. But I just really want to know, are you going to keep standing there and pushing this message out, or are you going to have the guts to walk away from these people? These people have and I'm talking about the sea organization behind Scientology they have a big bark, they have no bite there's no consequences to any celebrity or any Scientologist really leaving 
just the consequences they make us believe in our minds will happen. You're not going to be turned away from eternal life just because you walked away from Scientology. That's the lie. Okay? There's no love in this religion. There just isn't. The word isn't there. Okay? I'd have so much more respect for it if it just had one policy that spoke about love and and these things that we should do for other human beings. There's not one homeless person the Sea Organization of Scientology has ever helped. In Los Angeles, hundreds of staff members every day walk past homeless people. We don't talk to them. We don't give them food. We don't give them shelter. We call them degraded beings. What kind of humans are we to do this? We're not being human. Scientology is the art of the art of self-delusion, the art of self-deception, and the art of becoming completely inhumane. Where every tone level below 2.0 on the tone scale is, is regarded as being inappropriate. But we're human for God's sakes. Are you telling me are you telling me it's inappropriate to cry and be sad when someone you love dies? They even have a name for it. They call it H E N R, human emotion and reaction. And it's not accepted. Human emotion and reaction is considered inappropriate behavior. I'm going to ask you one more time. Take a look at the message you're sending out there. I don't care about the message from the Catholic Church or the Quran or anything else. I'm talking about you and the message you're sending out there. You're, you're getting people into Scientology. And some of them are going to die for it. Because the fact of the matter is, most people that walk into Scientology are just as successful as when they walked in, as to when they walked out. There's very few people out of the apparent hundreds of thousands and millions of Scientologists worldwide. How many have walked in, become super brilliant, and then walked out the other end as a superstar actor? Hardly any. The truth is, you were just damn good at what you were doing beforehand. And you had your own natural abilities. Scientology didn't change anything. So when you go for a medical exam next time, the next time you listen to your doctor, try to understand there are thousands of people around the world in this organization, women, that don't get checked for breast cancers. They don't get pap smear tests that can save their lives. And it's because people like you are pushing the message, it's okay to have a religion that does this. This is a personal message for Mike Rinder and Marty Rathburn. Following the posting on YouTube of my video, uh, I have received a couple of uh, messages and I've also witnessed a couple of statements being made around the world uh, that are fundamentally criticising you for not coming forward. I'm not 100% in agreement with the comments that have been made and I'll explain why. Uh, first of all, the intention in my video when I was talking about YouTube was not to uh, have criticism born upon you, okay, beyond what I was talking about. This was never a personal attack on YouTube, okay. This was about your actions and about what you did and about what you're not talking about. And I still believe that to be the case. I don't think it's right for people to all of a sudden jump up and call you both liars and non-confrontists, okay. Um, because I understand that it takes a while to go through the process of evaluating the information about the Sea Org and Scientology. And I've heard enough of the words hate and evil and working for this guy and dead agent and really working for the church. I've heard enough of that garbage. Okay. I hope you're not working for the church. I hope, I hope this isn't a hoax that you two are out just so that you can do what happened to the Cult Awareness Network and infiltrate it and then give all the names back to the Sea Org. That, that better not be happening. Um, but you have, to, you have to admit that the lack of information that you're providing does seem suspicious. And I'd like you to take a look at that and understand why. Okay. Um, where are you coming from? What's the purpose of you launching your blog spot? If it's to save Scientology, if that's your goal, 
then good luck to you. And if people join you on that, then okay. But we don't need we don't need another sea organisation, Marty. It, it was never needed in the first place. The only reason it was created was because Ron himself did things that were wrong. The same man that's being defended out there by people that are uh, pro-Scientology but anti-Sea Org is the same man. It's the same man that created the Sea Org. It's the same man that created the beaching policy, the RPF policy. I mean, Marty and Mike, when are you going to look at Ron Hubbard as a man? For a man that was supposed to be so OT to write these policy letters about beaching a human being, punishing a human being, putting a human being on beans and rice, throwing him overboard, putting him into a rehabilitation colony and, and forbidding communication with other human beings. This is wrong! Okay, take a look at those and try to somehow disassociate this idea that Ron knew it all because he didn't. We don't need to be OTs. There's no reason to be able to move an object. There's no reason to be able to exteriorize. You don't need these things. Okay? Real OT is is a guy trying to feed his family and making it go right. That's an OT. You know? Have you ever been to China or Indonesia and seen, you know, millions of people that will never ever ever have money because there is no money there and they work 12 hours a day just to feed their family. That's an OT. The, the mum at home looking after three kids, that's an OT. Okay? A firefighter going into a burning building, that's an OT. A doctor, your dentist, these are OTs. The guy that takes your garbage outside the front of your house in the middle of the night. That's an OT. It's not the guy with the most money. It's not the guy who's most successful. Okay? It's a, you know, where did we learn to look at things as up and down gradients? That's not what humanity is about. Humanity is about being human. And what does it mean to be human? Okay? Just take another look. That's all I'm asking you to do. If your goal is to destroy the Sea Org, I'm with you. If your goal is to replace the Sea Org with another organization that's going to control what we think and making sure the tech is this and making sure the tech is that, I'm not interested and neither is anybody else. Because even the guy out there that still wants Scientology but not this suppressive management, even that guy that wants Scientology still just wants to go off and freely do what he wants to do. When are you going to understand it wasn't the fact that the tech was altered that made Scientology fail. It was because Scientology as a basic principle doesn't work. Any religious, and I use the word religious because the church does, any system of belief where every solution is best served by the application of only Scientology Do I have to point? Do you know? Do we have to connect the dots here? If Scientology is the ultimate answer, then why don't we just go kill everybody now that's 2.0 or below on the tone scale? Why don't we just kill everybody now that's anti-Scientology? I mean, where's the empathy? Where's the compassion? This is about love. If you're going to leave the Sea Org and and, and and come out here and crusade for the for, for, for people to freely think. Think about those families and those people that were hurt. They need help. Not a book on Scientology. You're sitting there trying to work out how to correct the tech. Hey, there's human beings here. They need help. Think about them. That book is going to be there in a thousand years. If you really believe you've lived before and you're going to live again, Fix it next lifetime. But right now, we've got a job to do. And it's to stop suppressive actions. 
And by suppressive actions, not the Scientology definition, which is anything against Scientology, I'm talking suppressive against human rights. Take another look, you two. Mike, Marty, look at where your families are today. Look at where David Miscavige's life is, where his children are, where his brother and, and his father are. This is, this, is, this is the result of application of, of junk. And just remember who wrote the policies on this stuff. Have another think about it. Because if you two are planning like an overthrow of the Sea Org so that you can control it and get Scientology fixed up, I'm not interested. And no one else is either. Just not interested. Okay? Stop what you're doing and just recover. Enjoy life. Learn to love someone. There's not going to be a single OT level you will ever do that will compare to having good friends around you and people that love you and a good partner in life. Nothing beats these things. Nothing ever will. Just think about it for a minute. Just remember all your friends in the sea all. They're all gone now. David Miscavige has destroyed most of his friends that were there at the start with him. Look at where you learned what friendship was and look at what you learned about love, which was hardly even mentioned uh, in the Sea Org. Okay? People are out here fighting for something. I hope they give you the time to recover and don't criticise you. But I'm not, uh, I'm not going to trust you right now, Marty or Mike, until I start seeing you talk about something that really is, self, is selfless. Okay, if you're going around talking to people that you've done things to because statute of limitations has passed and you can't be punishable by law anymore, you're a coward. You're a coward. You're an absolute coward if that's the case. Talk now and show us that you're actually on board with this. Because people out there want to know. And frankly, so do I. And I'd like an answer. So uh, I was asked to give information regarding the uh, income mission of 1995 into the uh, pack base. What happened is that uh, on St. Valentine's Day in 1995, um, the CMO International and RTC moved into income to shut it down. Uh, what had been discovered was a fairly substantial security breach where a member of INCOM had put information regarding uh, very particular documents out on the internet. The reason why I'm talking about this is this is possibly the, in my opinion, the greatest violation of basic fundamental human rights uh, ever in the history of the SEAL that I witnessed personally. What happened is on that day, uh, Liz Engber, one of the more senior long-term SEAL members uh, took a team into INCOM and without warning locked all the doors uh, to the entire INCOM location in the Pacific base in Los Angeles. None of the staff knew what was going on uh, and they were all kept in the dark. Over at CMO IXU, uh, over the other location at 6331 Holly Boulevard, we knew what was about to happen. Uh, the reason why we knew is that we were told that there would be uh, a large number of replacements probably needed for the INCOM staff after the mission had been through with them. We knew that there was probably only going to be one or two security breaches, but the, uh, the fact of the matter was that the process of discovery of those security breaches was probably going to result in a couple of the staff members wanting to leave or being required to leave. <coughs> anyway, so the staff were all hoarded into an office and in another uh, office, all the missionaries were waiting for them. And what they did is the staff were one by one put through the office, told to empty out their pockets, take off their shoes, uh, and so forth, and then they were each separately interrogated. Uh, what happened was is that the, they knew that a modem over at INCOM had been used to transfer the information out, and now they wanted to know which INCOM operator had done it, and also whether or not any of the other INCOM staff were in on it. None of the income staff were allowed to make any phone calls to family. None of the income staff were permitted to see any of their family members in the seal or even their children. At that point, all communication was barred, even between 
income staff themselves. Over the next several weeks, all of them were made to sleep there in income, and there were guards posted on all the doors and they were not permitted to leave. The food was brought to the location and they were given meals and made to sleep there in Incom, totally against their rights. They, all of them asked to leave, all of them were refused to leave. Uh, they made repeated requests to leave. It's just, it just wasn't going to happen, not until we found out what that security breach was. It was strange for other members of the um, of AOLA and other sealed members at that base because they knew that all of a sudden all the INCOM staff had just disappeared and they knew that there were guards posted at the doors. And even the Estates Project Force, which is the base of training for the Sea Org, knew about this because they were asked to take food to the door where the food was then taken through and then to, all the trash was taken out. The, eventually personal hygiene became a problem because they weren't showering. So what happened is we had guards take uh, all the income staff one by one up to receive a shower and they were only permitted three minutes for personal hygiene and then they were brought back down to income and locked up again. Um, what then followed was uh, later on um, some of the people just lost their minds uh, they were just they weren't just security checked or interrogated by one person they were security checked and interrogated by another and another and another and then another um, on this and most of them didn't make it through this I remember seeing some of them uh, later on afterwards that we had to replace because my job was to provide the, the resources, the personnel resources uh, to replace other staff in the SEAL that could then go fill the spots that had now been lost in INCOM because they just lost their minds uh, you know, or lost their families it was, it was horrible and some of them were from international locations, they didn't have any means or resources to survive, so they took the option of going on to the RPF. I mean, it was disgusting, and then they were permitted to never discuss it uh, ever again with anybody. That was my involvement in it, and then it got worse for me because all the computer systems around the world were considered uh, to be defunct and susceptible to attack, and there were three missionaries selected to go around the world. One was Eric Profilich, he was to do Europe. The other one was a Mexican fellow. He was the qualifications director at CMO and he was asked to go to do the South American trip uh, to re-encrypt the computers there. And the final mission was to go to the Flag Land Base and the Free Winds ship in the Caribbean and I was selected for that. It was a very unusual mission. Uh, no one was to know about it. No one was to know who I was to see. No one was to know I was a SEALD member. I was to go as a civilian, undercover. Um, I was to take the encryption tapes in a briefcase, handcuffed to my hand, and I was to travel to the Flag Land Base, provide those to, I believe it was Greg Johnson, at the Flag Land Base to re-encrypt the computers there. Then I was to go to the ship. But early on, trouble started to surface. The first one is there were no written mission orders. The only people that knew about my mission was Lucas Sacamano, Fleur Thomas, WDC so-and-so, uh, Amy Mortland, uh, and the RTC reports officer, who I never knew the name. I just spoke to him over the phone. No mission orders were in writing. Uh, the mission was never to be revealed to another human being. The mission was never to be discussed. What happened is the missions fired out. In my briefing, I was told that there was a, a high risk potential of being intercepted to have the tapes uh, removed from my person. And I was told that in that event, I was, to, I was to place my life on the line to protect those tapes because those tapes represented the, the very security of the Sea Org. Um, I was due to fire out at midnight and this was around about uh, early March. I was due to fire out uh, around midnight. Um, I did not fire out because I lost my passport. 
Uh, that was entirely my fault. There was no sealed paranoia involved there at all. I, I misplaced it and eventually I found it. Um, but they said that security had been breached because I had fired late. And as a result, I was to take a number of plane trips through, uh, down through Houston, Dallas, Pensacola, uh, New Orleans, and all these other locations in order to get down to Miami and then from, uh, before Miami, go to Florida. Um, it was a highly paranoid state of affairs. Um, I violated mission orders, and for some reason, I don't know why to this day, but uh, I packed up my mission uniform anyways and took it along as luggage. I just wanted to have it with me. Uh, I think it ended up saving my life having that uh, uniform with me, and I'll get to that later. I arrived at the Flag Land Base around about 4 a.m. and went to the uh, to the Clearwater building where I met Greg Johnson. He took the tapes from me, he went into the computer room, and then he came back out about a minute later. And this seemed strange to me because I knew based off of the Incom computers that the the encryption time would have to be within the five to ten minute margin. He couldn't possibly have encrypted the systems with the new information so fast. And that was the first alarm bell that rang off in my head. But he gave me the tape back and said, now this is for the like, lamp, uh, for the ship. So I went out to a berthing and I crashed uh, in a berthing there for a few hours and then I was taken out to the airport where I flew to Miami. And then from Miami, I took Aruba Airlines and flew to Aruba. This is where I was first intercepted. Uh, a gentleman on board the flight made it a point to come and sit next to me. Uh, he was asking me a lot of questions, and it became quite clear to me that he knew exactly what I was doing on the uh, airline with the, the suitcase being strapped to my hand. I told him to, to get lost, told him I didn't want to speak to him, blah, blah, blah. When I landed in Aruba, I went through the gates of clearance, and an unusual thing happened. Uh, I was very suspicious of the tapes that I had and the partition where you go through to get your stamp to go on the island was sealed off, and two armed guards took position behind me and had machine guns pointed at me. and they remain there until I finished answering the questions. And I answered the questions and I was allowed to go through. When I got outside, I was met by um, a man I didn't know. He was clearly not a Scientologist. Um, and he knew who I was. So I don't know how he knew that. And he took me to a bar called the Talk of the Town. And I stayed there because the ship wasn't hadn't docked yet. It was to dock at midnight. Midnight came. And I was walking up the gangplank uh, up the ship and Greg Wilhair pops out. Uh, now he's the Inspector General at the time, second only to David Miscavige in the seal. He popped out, shook my hand, said thank you for coming aboard and just rushed me into the place. He, there was no introduction to the captain or anything, I was just taken I was taken into the um, into the uh, into the offices and Greg Wilhair briefed me that he had been on the ship doing security checking, that Marty Rathburn was on the ship uh, going through conditions and handlings, uh, which I found shocking because the idea that Marty Rathburn would have doubts on the seal was just unreal to me. I mean, the man was a solid icon of the tech. It blew me away to hear that. But anyway, Greg Wilhair told me he had security checked the entire ship and he told me that they believed that the real security breach they were really after was actually on the ship. And he told me to take caution in my mission. So I immediately grabbed, there were two computer operators on the ship. Uh, one for the ship, and then one just for the IAS. And I forget the name of the man for the ship, but I'll never forget the man for the IAS. Uh, it was, his name was Viet Le Quang. What happened is I went to uh, the officers uh, the computer off offices, and there I had the encryption done uh, by the ship operator. And I quizzed him for a time, and finally he admitted that there was a way to breach this encryption tape, and he told me the exact procedure for it. I asked him if Viet Le Quang would know this, and he said he would. So what I did is I then called in Viet Le Quang into the offices, 
and put him through the same procedures and quizzed him. And he wouldn't admit that there was a way to breach the encryption tapes. So finally, I told him how to do it, based off of what the operator had not only told me, but shown me. And Viet Le Quang doubted it, went red in the face, and said, oh, I don't think you could really do that. Bang, that was it. HCO, bring order, you're under house arrest. Picked up the phone, security, HCO, bring order, now, computer room. Bang, security comes, clicks up Viet Le Quang, and off he goes. I immediately tell the computer operator not to leave the office. I then go and see Greg Will here. I tell Greg Will here what happens. He goes, right, go to your cabin and wait here. So I went to my cabin, waited there. Three hours later, Greg Will here has messengers come and get me. I come and see uh, Greg. And this is what he told me. Now, this is paranoia, okay? You have to believe it. This is what he told me. Okay, you cannot reconcile this event. He told me that Viet Le Quang had a history that he had just discovered on Secretary that he had worked for the NSA, that he worked for the FBI, and possibly even the CIA. This is what he told me. And it blew me away because Greg, Will Greg Willhead just told me he sex checked everybody on the ship. So how did he miss that? This is Greg Willhead. But you don't question it. Greg Willhead just told me. We're going, to, we're going to fix up the McQuang. And I said, well, he should be beached. He goes, no, he knows something right now. I said, well, we'll beach him afterwards. And Greg Will has said, we certainly will. So I left it at that. You know, what do I do now on the mission? You know, I thought, this was not in the mission orders. He said to wait there in my cabin again, so I waited in the cabin. He called me back to the office and told me I was not to leave the ship. There was to be no communication back to Los Angeles at all that I was only to make one call to the RTC reports officer and that was via a mobile phone. Okay? The no communication would have be gone off the ship with my name on it. Okay. I called up the RTC reports off and he said, find a solution to the security breach. So I came up with one which involved another encryption tape being kept in a file safe room that was to be kept in the class uh, the OT8 course uh, folder room on the ship and that the um, security would have to escort the uh, computer operator daily to go grab the encryption tape. A, a pretty weak solution, but my other follow-ups included uh, a honeypot idea and a tracking system for Incom to deploy against future hacks. Uh, that's quite a lengthy explanation on that, and I gave that um, in writing to Greg Wool here, and he kept it. What then happened is uh, over the next day I spent on the ship, um, I don't recall a great deal of what happened, I, I, I simply, I, I just don't. I was given a tour of the ship by the Deputy Commanding Officer of the CMO on the ship, and post that I was told and given a call on the mobile by somebody, not the RTC reports officer, just to go leave the ship, which was still in port in Aruba, and that there would be a car waiting for me and I was to leave. Okay. And that was to happen at around about 6 or 7 a.m. or something like that. What then happened is I went back to my cabin, and in the middle of the night, the deputy commanding officer of CMO ship came to my cabin, and she told me to put that the package of my uniform had arrived from the airport. And she, the first question was, why wasn't it carry-on luggage? And I told her because I had the briefcase, and they wouldn't let me take two packages on board the airline so it had to be stowed under, even though it only weighed two kilograms. Um, she said it had been returned and she wanted me to wear it. And I said I couldn't do that. It was a, it was a confidential mission. No one's supposed to know that I'm even a messenger. Um, and she said, well, I think it would be a good idea if you did wear this uniform and walk around the ship. She appealed to my ego because she said, well, this could slap the crew and get them better producing. I mean... <laughs> It appealed to my ego because at the time, the Greg Will here himself is on the ship. If that guy's not going to get you producing, no, no one's going to get you producing. But she got to my ego, so I did. I walked around the ship and did this. And then I went out on the, the deck early in the morning and I had a Cuban cigar on the deck to celebrate the end of the mission. The, the, uh, the following that morning, oh, oh, while I was on the deck of the ship, a photo was taken of me. From one of the, uh, from the top deck, 
I didn't know who took the photo. It was a Polaroid shot. I just heard this woman saying, got you. I assumed it was the DCO, the Deputy Commanding Officer on the ship uh, for CMO, but I didn't know. And I never saw her again. Um, what then happened is I then went back to the cabin, showered, went out to the airport and took a whole series of planes back to Los Angeles. But before I got back to Los Angeles, the same man that was on the um, plane flight from Miami to Aruba was on the flight that I took to Houston. And he confronted me. And I, uh, I decided I had to deal with this. He was getting aggressive. I had tapes that were given to me by Greg Will here to take back to Los Angeles. I didn't know what was on the tapes. So I confronted him in the bar uh, at the Houston airport. There was a stopover, and I don't remember what happened. I, I just do not know what happened. The next thing you know, I'm in Los Angeles, I'm at the airport, and there's no car waiting for me. I call up external communications at the Hollywood Guaranteed Building and go, hey, it's Aaron, where's my car? And they're like, sorry, sir, what car? I've landed. Where's my car to get back to the building? Like, sorry, sir, I didn't receive any request to pick you up. Okay, well, can you come and get me? Okay, they come out, they come and get me, they drive me back. When I get back, I don't go to my berthing straight away. I go straight to the building to report the mission completion. And um, I get to the building, walk in the front door. I go up to level uh, level six where CMO was located at that particular time. Or no, level seven, level seven or six, seven. And um, my security card doesn't work anymore. Well, that's strange. So. I wait and wait for a messenger to walk out the door and they're like, oh Aaron, you're back. Where have you been? They had no idea. And I walk in the door and uh, I walk straight into the Luca's office, Deputy Commanding Officer for CMO. And he just looks so surprised to see me. He's like, Aaron, <laughs> you're back. Like, yeah, didn't you know? Hey, what's with my security card? It's cancelled or something. You know, and he diverts the conversation. And then I look on the desk, and he's got all my files on the desk. And I missed a withhold on him. There's something in the files he doesn't want me to see. And he shoves the files to the left side. I can see that there's a piece of goldenrod there, but I don't know what it is. And then he pulls out this photo. It's the Polaroid that was taken from me on the ship, which meant that the person that was on that ship must have taken the Polaroid. It's not something you can send by email. It's a, it's a flash Polaroid photo. Which means someone else had brought back that photo as fast as I could get to Los Angeles. And alarm bells started ringing off in my head. I didn't get it. I didn't understand what was going on. <laughs> Anyways, I um, then went back up to the International Clearances Office because that's where we were uh, working on the... Um, the clearances for all the new income staff and I was told up there Aaron you're being immediately cleared don't tell anybody you're being cleared you're going to the end base you're going now we've got to get your clearances done in 24 hours I said why I, why am I going there you, know, you have to go you have to go now so you're not the HCO chief anymore you're not on post anymore okay you're going to end oh Oh, okay. Going to end. Great. And that night, walking back to my birthing, my brain started to send alarm bells. Why was my security guard cancelled? Why was there no card? Who was that guy that followed me from the ship? Who was that guy on the Aruban Airlines flight? And alarm bells just went off and off and off. And I blew that morning. I took off. And uh, the first phone call I made after a day being out, I wanted to speak to Lucas Sacramento because I knew they'd be looking for me. And I called into the Hollywood Guarantee Building on the main line number. And when I got to reception, the receptionist said, Oh, sir, are you calling from Europe? I went, No. She said, Oh, you're not on... You're not in Europe on mission? 
No, I'm here in Los Angeles. Can I please speak with the deputy CO, CMO, please? What the hell's going on? Okay. I hung up the phone. I then called up. We had a travel company that uh, did all the flights for all our missions and stuff. So I called them up, and they and I had a security code, which hadn't been cancelled yet. And I booked the first class ticket back to New Zealand from LAX. And I booked it to leave in two hours. And I got it. Maybe three or four hours, actually, to be more accurate. And I didn't have any intention of going on the flight. I just went to the LA terminals. I waited across the road because I wanted to find out how many people that they would send out after me. And I was shocked. A van pulled up. A van pulled up. And Jeff Porter, Sue Porter, and CMO staff, and a lot of OSA staff jumped out of the van. I'm talking nine people, and came running into the LA terminal after me. And Jesus Christ, they really wanted me not to go on that flight. But I knew I couldn't run away from them forever. I'd have to go back. So I went running around Los Angeles, called up my mum in New Zealand and she told me they'd called there for looking for me and I called back into the building spoke to Luke and he said if you don't come in right now we're sending 20 people off to Australia we're sending people off to New Zealand to talk to your family we're going to find you and I told him to call it off I'll come in I came back in and what happened between March 1995 and the end of my career with the Sea Org in January 1996 is just the most insulting story of paranoia and control you'd ever imagine. And I'll go into it another time. But I wanted to keep this about the INCOM mission and the facts of the matter there. We are talking about the greatest violations of human rights that all those INCOM staff members around the world uh, suffered. and. If you want to talk about false imprisonment and uh, blackmail, go find the income staff that were hassled and harassed in February 1995 and find out what happened to them. Their stories are all true. As unbelievable as they may sound, I was there and I helped with this. There's nothing fictitious about it. This happened right in the heart of Los Angeles, first class country where human rights are celebrated and appreciated and right there in East Hollywood, just off of Hollywood Boulevard, these guys were trapped and contained for some periods that exceeded more than a month. And there's no justification for it. There is just nothing you can imagine to tell you the horror those staff went through because they were bullied and controlled for I, don't, I think some of them thought they were going to die. Some of them wanted to kill themselves. It came up in their security checks. They wanted to end their lives because of the, the, the punishment that they received for even allowing a fellow income staff member to cause a breach was now their fault, and they were all punished severely for it. And I want the governor of Los Angeles to launch an inquiry and get the affidavits and statements from not just the sealed victims on that case, but from the people like Liz Ingber, the Bolstads of this world, Deputy Senior CS International, and the RTC security staff that did, did that horrific set checking on all those people and just absolutely screwed with their minds. And I think everybody wants to see that too. It's not just me. But you want a specific example of the, the greatest human rights violation in the seal that ever happened? There's your date, there's your time. And I wish I could give you the names of the income staff members. But you know what? They've already spoken out on the internet and nobody believes them, but it's all true. Yeah, hi there. Uh, the reason for this uh, video is because I just received an email from someone else who has had information used uh, against them with the Church of Scientology. So this actually is a video that is primarily directed really towards the media and your responsibilities when it comes to people who go ahead and reveal information about the Scientology network. I'm going to reveal something here I, I didn't particularly want 
didn't want to at this particular point in time, but I'm going to do it anyways. Probably this has been brought around by the fact that the seven people in Australia that spoke out against the Church of Scientology have been harassed, and uh, I've had private investigators visit my mother in New Zealand and force her into talking about things she didn't want to talk about. Uh, another member here has been followed in her car repeatedly and we have another member in Melbourne who has had obvious private investigators follow them. So if there's any doubt to Scientologists or the media out there that we get uh, harassed for speaking out against the church, I think the book is closed on that subject. What I wanted to talk about was the celebrities in Scientology and why they can't leave precisely. Okay. Uh, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of celebrities do want to leave the church, but they can't. And I'll explain to you the precise reason why they can't. The mechanism used to get information on celebrities is as follows. Um, when you walk into a church of Scientology, and uh, particularly if you're a celebrity, and you walk into a church of Scientology, you're given a confessional, a chance to relieve yourself of those things that you've been that you've been doing in your life that aren't okay. And often after the confessional, you're visited by the ethics officer, the person in the church that's responsible for handling, you know, what you've done. And often, um, I, I, the same thing happened to me. I gave a confessional believing that it was auditing when in fact it wasn't. It's done like a session. It's done like an auditing session, but it's actually not covered by confidentiality. And after I did my confession, I was taken to the... Um, to the ethics officer where what had happened is the case supervisor had written up reports about what I had done and given it to the ethics officer and the ethics officer sat me down and said well look you've done all these bad things and my response as well as what the celebrity response is but that's confessional you can't use that and the response back to them is well we have an obligation to report anything illegal to the police and then what they do is they grab the book of ethics on Scientology and they say to you, well, look, if you help the group on the planet that's doing the greatest good for the most number of people, that would make up the damage done by what you've been involved in. And it's a fundamental way to co coerce you into joining staff or to make donations to the International Association of Scientologists or, if you're in the case of a celebrity, to remain with Scientology. During my time in the SEAL working in the Church of Scientology International, my division was responsible for sending all communications to David Miscavige and Religious Technology Centre and the international management located out in Riverside County. So I saw files and information being sent um, because my division was responsible for that and I was the senior over it for three years. And I can tell you that uh, celebrities such as uh, Leah Romini, uh, Jenna Elfman, um, Lisa Marie Presley and John Travolta all have had files created on them that contain everything that they've done that could be used to blackmail them. The mechanism used by the church uh, is that if anybody leaves, such as a celebrity or a top-ranking member of the church, and then goes public against them, what they will do is they have uh, a methodology whereby what they do is they take the information, they provide it to a private investigator, and they tell them, look, this is what we know about the person. And they give everything that they know about it. And because it's been revealed in sessions in Scientology, they know where it happened, who was involved, and everything. What the private investigator is then asked to do is to go out and find another source of information that will verify the existence of that information. So that what can then happen is if the celebrity leaves, then all of a sudden CNN will get, or Nightline or something will get a, a piece of information from somebody in the public that confirms a source for, let's say, confirming that a celebrity took lots of cocaine or cheated on his wife or or uh, was involved in like homosexual activities or was involved in lesbian activities. And that way, it doesn't seem like the church has released the information, but in fact they have. Um, the church uses this information um, in such cases, like with Lisa Marie Presley, I well remember after her marriage, 
uh, to Michael Jackson. She was pulled into the Hollywood Guarantee Building on Hollywood Boulevard uh, and was escorted upstairs by Heber Gents, where Heber Gents instructed her that it was in her best interest to um, create the divorce with Michael Jackson um, because he was unstable, because he represented an actual threat to the church. So these things really do happen. Um, now, in the when we're talking about a celebrity like Don Travolta, I can tell you he has a file that he is not in control of. The file is not located at Celebrity Centre International. It is located uh, with David. Mas it's not even located at the Office of Special Affairs International in Hollywood Boulevard. It is located up at the Riverside County, and David Miscavige has access to that file. And it is through this that these celebrities are coerced. And the real problem here is not that uh, that they look. If you have to take it from a point of view, if this uh, celebrity walks out, the problem with the media in the United States is is that when they get a source of information, they're just going to run with it. So you've got John Travolta sitting here. He wants to leave the church, and it's because of the media that he can't do it. Because you're going to offer him no respect. You're going to offer him no privacy. How is this man supposed to do the right thing if all of a sudden, a month after he leaves the church, all of a sudden some story comes out about something he's done after he did Grease or Saturday Night Live and there's a, a verified source? The media is going to run with it and you're going to paint this guy in whatever light you want. You, you, the media, do not make it very easy for a man like John Travolta or a celebrity like Lisa Marie Prezzi to even leave the Church of Scientology because you don't understand. Okay, these guys have told them everything that they've ever done. Everything. They know everything about these people. So how are they supposed to leave? Right now I can tell you that there is a file in existence. I have seen the file. Okay, it is there. It exists. It was sent up to Riverside County where David Miscavige and the top levels of Scientology uh, have their base. And that file contains all the information on the times and dates that John did something. So how is he supposed to get out of the church? And this is the conundrum I propose to the media to help somebody like Don Travolta find a solution to his problem. Okay, I can tell you right now that the personnel fire file example of Leah Romini, I've read this in detail, I know everything she did as a child, I know what she was involved in. Okay. You know, that file was sent directly to Liz Ingber, okay, in the Sea Org, and she works right at the top with David Miscavige. Now, that's just one example of where I have been involved in preparing the information on these people, and it does exist. So my question to the people out there, to the celebrities, to the media, is how are you going to make it okay for a celebrity to leave Scientology? Did John Travolta do things that he should be worried about? Yes, he should. Is it out of the Statue of Limitations? Yes, it is. But it's not out of the Statue of Limitations of Embarrassment. I mean, are you okay as a media group to allow a person to admit to mistakes and to come forward? Or are you going to prosecute him and paint him as, as a liar his whole life? Do you understand that this man was blackmailed? He has been told, you must stay within the church. You must make donations. You must take money and give to us. You know, this has been this guy's life, not been able to live as freely as he wants. And for all intents and purposes, John Travolta is a good man, don't you think? He hasn't committed any crimes, he hasn't beaten anybody up. What are we going to do as a society and a media to let him live his life if he decides to leave the church? Because he does want to leave. And I know that a number of other celebrities also want to do that. You know, you have to remember, this stuff has also been recorded on video and audio. At the Flag Land Base in Florida where you get the higher levels of Scientology and on the Free Winds ship out in the Caribbean, they have bugging devices and audio and visual recording equipment in the rooms where people talk about their private matters. And they tell the people that it's been recorded so that the person supervising their, pro their their progress through Scientology can make sure that nothing's missed. That you know they can make sure that you know that they are looked after. The truth of the matter is, copies of those tapes are made and kept separate, and we allow we allow this to happen by allowing the existence of the church. So, 
you know, when you're sitting out there wondering why don't these celebrities leave, that's the reason why they don't leave. It's because they can't. And if somebody was to ask me, have these celebrities done things that they should be embarrassed about? I can tell you from looking in their files, they certainly do have things that they should be embarrassed about. So I'm not going to speak of them, but know this for sure. If they leave the church, somebody will speak about it and they will be, you know, they wish they hadn't have left the church. So um, I'm just putting it out there. What is the media going to do to cut them a break if they leave? You know, it's time not to think about your ratings for just one minute and that five minute spiel and spreading that guy's life through a newspaper for 30 seconds. You know, when are you going to live up to your moral responsibilities to allow the truth to be spoken without penalty? Otherwise, how can you demand somebody come true and, 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 and make things right if they can't be given the right opportunity to do that? It's not the public's business what John Travolta did when he was younger, or Lisa Marie Presley's. It's not your business. So, if they come forward and they decide to leave the church, and inevitably, when you get your little bit of gossip from another confirmed source, are you going to take the responsibility and not run with it? And I don't think you will. So the real reason why they're not leaving Scientology is not because of Scientology. It's because of you, the media. And you're directly responsible for it. Yeah, good evening, people. Uh, it's nice to finally talk to you about uh, things going on in the real world as well as here. Um, this uh, attack and launch on Scientology and the Sea Org, I hope everybody watching this um, still gets along with their own personal life. I know I'm trying to. Um, I've received more than 2,000 emails. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with it. Um, so if some of my answers are a bit short, I'll get to you in a couple of weeks or a week um, because I'm doing a couple of radio shows and uh, getting some things out for some newspapers around the world. So. A little bit tired right now. <laughs> no time to listen to Def Leppard. But um, look, I did want to discuss one last thing with everybody uh, before I take a bit of a break from the videos. Finally, the Church of Scientology issued a statement about uh, what I said in my letter to Senator Xenophon. And they've come back with some uh, interesting answers. Not really a surprise, considering we are talking about the church here. And we know, we all know what to expect. Fundamentally, what they're saying here in their statement back is that uh, they describe me as being a mean, hateful young man who was once caught by fellow staff members shooting a BB gun at homeless people, who carried knives, dangerous spikes, and was given a chance to redeem himself. They say here that the church assisted me in an eight-year medical program for a condition that I had. They also say that I put up an anti-Scientology website and tried to extort the church to pay me $75,000 for them to buy the domain. They also say that Senator Xenophon got some of the things wrong. And, the, and, of course, I'm a chronic liar. Now, I could really go on about this, but I really find it quite amusing. I mean, um, I gave all this credibility to the church and said that they would come after me really hard. And this is the best they can do. Um, perhaps our mutual enemy really are just thick as two bricks. And I'll tell you why. In their public statement regarding Aaron, they didn't actually answer any allegation whatsoever. But I'm going to comment on it briefly and quickly. I did shoot at homeless people. It wasn't just me, it was other people. We enjoyed it. Uh, myself and 200 SEAL members would walk past these homeless people in Los Angeles every day. We didn't give them food. We didn't talk to them. Remember, they were downstats. They were degraded beings. The church watched some of them die. 
We uh, didn't give them shelter. We didn't even give them a blanket. So, um, yeah, I shot a BB gun at them, and I did a lot worse than that, too. Um, try to understand back then I was a different human being, and to me back then they were complete scum and less than human. Of course, they're not that, and they deserve better treatment than any sealed member I know. Yes, I was consistently out ethics throughout my entire time in the SEAL and I was always in trouble. Every committee of evidence on me was torn up because I did so well at being an enforcer for them and after every major out ethics incident I was in actual fact promoted. After the incidents they talk about me shooting the BB gun I was promoted twice following that. They enjoyed me because I was very hard line for them and right to the very end I was celebrated for my art ethics and rewarded for it. When I was 17 my mother saved me from dying by pulling me out of the Sea Org to go to the hospital. The church refused to pay for a taxi and refused to call an ambulance. My mum did all that. If uh, she didn't do that I wouldn't be here today. The Sea Org gave me a four week medical program uh, which included me getting all my medication from the hospital so they didn't have to pay for it. And they gave me an auditing program which uh, was to, quote, talk to the organs of my body and have the organs of my body talk back to me. There was no medical treatment as claimed in the statement that ran for eight years. There was no medical treatment at all. When I eventually got to Los Angeles years later, because I was in charge of finances, I proved for myself uh, a six to eight week program whereby the doctors would test my blood and tell me what my potassium level was. It didn't actually include any medical treatment of any kind. Uh, I won't go into the part where the Scientology has always had a policy of sending people to medical doctors. We both know that's just not true. Um, in 2005, Aaron did put up an anti-Scientology website. I did it because uh, the church here in New Zealand wouldn't leave my family alone. When I did put the website up, they considered it a threat and they wanted it back. And I said the domain name is valuable, you can buy it for 75 grand. I knew they weren't going to pay for it. The reason why I asked for that is because they also decided to come and harass me and my family and call them up, call me, calling me at my place of work. And Nick, uh, Mike Ferris himself personally refused to, to leave my property in Mount Albert and demanded that he speak to me about it. We reached a settlement where I paid, where they paid me $100 for the website and Mike Ferris, a Scientologist, bought the website. The agreement was I would lay off them if they finally would agree to lay off my family and they agreed. Months later, they broke that agreement. Hence, my disdain for them and the fact of that's why I'm here doing what I'm doing. Uh, they spoke about Mr. Xenophon getting wrong statements, which I can't really deny. He had a lot of information there, but it is true that there was an attempted rape of me, and it is true that the Church of Scientology covered it up. It is also true that I was chased by a man with a knife, who was known to the Sea Org as an enemy and that we refused to deal with this. And that on both occasions I was punished for allowing an out public relations situation to exist. Uh, they've made a comment on my beans and rice, which is completely false. They haven't answered the question. In fact, they haven't answered any of the allegations at all. They're doing what they normally do by issuing out a uh, statement to try to make me look like a twat. Unfortunately for them, they make themselves look like a twat because my ethics files do show I was a bad son of a bitch um, for all my time in the SEAL, and yet, amazingly, I just keep getting promoted for it. Um, um, but I did. I was promoted because I would uh, do things that no one else sadly would do. Um, they say I left in 95 and 96 from the SEAL. It's untrue, I left three times, and every time... They begged me to come back. They waived all my out qualifications and told me every time I can be a messenger. Um, so, uh, 
you know, we all know what it's like to blow from that place and they call you back and, you know, afterwards they say we tried to help them. Uh, it's very interesting, isn't it? That's about it from the public side. Um, I've met some really great people um, through contacting me through the videos and I'm really proud to meet you all. Um, there's uh, some big things on the horizon with some newspapers and some television stations around the world and we're going to go for them. I just hope that um, everybody can keep in mind that I'm um, a little bit uh, upset by what's going on and I'm trying to find time to relax and I just love you all. Not because you're on my YouTube channel, just because you send me emails that come from the heart and it goes to show that uh, we've all gained something from talking and speaking. Um, I can't thank you enough for your emails. Um, yeah, that's about it. And um, uh, I'll be in touch again after the weekend. There's some exciting things happening over here. And don't forget to live life and have a laugh. And... Uh, I'll try to do the same. See you later, for now. This is an important message to all public, Scientologists, ex-Scientologists, current SEALD members and previous SEALD members. I'm about to give to the public the true answer as to why the Church of Scientology International will not answer the question regarding the supposed and purported Xenu story of 75 million years ago. This is the true reason, and I'll explain it now. Currently, the public have been told that the Church of Scientology believes that on their operating Thetan level 3, that they uncover an incident whereby a galactic emperor called Xenu enslaves up to 13 trillion aliens and brings them to Earth and then once they're here they're trapped in summary. But what is the real reason why the Church of Scientology won't talk about it? I'll explain this now. And the shocking thing is is that most of the Scientologists that have in actual fact even done the Wall of Fire, OT3, do not even know this. The real reason is that in 1967, when L. Ron Hubbard created the Sea Organization aboard the boat and made himself a Commodore, a rank, a naval rank, uh, leader of this cult called the Sea Organization, he outlined in a policy letter that he had uncovered that not only were psychiatrists apparently previous members of this galactic emperor's staff, but that the World Bank and its members were also primary loyal officers of Xenu and that they were here back on Earth to carry out this absurd mission of taking over humanity. He labelled all the World Bank leaders as members of the Xenu party. He also stated in this policy letter not a confidential teaching that Xenu was here on Earth still to this day are waiting for them to gain control of the world finances and population. Within this he outlined that the Sea Org in actual reality, its symbol is a laurel wreath of 26 leaves and a star. Each of the 26 leaves outlined one of the planets that the Sea Org must travel to over the next billion years in order to help these people. The reason for the billion year contract is not because it is some kind of a glib indication of their loyalty to the sea organization. It is an actual fact outlined in a policy letter that L. Ron Hubbard calculated it would take approximately one billion years to leave Earth and fix these other 25 planets, including our own. There are no coincidences here. I'm telling the public this so that when you talk to a Scientologist, rather than talking to them about their OT3, talk to them about the sealed policy letter which was written, which outlined that one, the world banks are the number one cause of all problems on planet Earth, even though they haven't only existed up until the last 50 years, but they happen to have been the trouble for the world for the last 10,000 years, and that the Jewish community 
of earth by Aaron Hubbard and according to him are genetically selected by these uh, trapped uh, body thetans, these souls and spirits traveling the world so that Jewish people's bodies are primarily selected by these body thetans and are primarily the members and the loyal staff of Zenu, who was here 75 million years ago and is still here today. He has labeled the entire Jewish community for selection for genocide. He is no different than Hitler. The C organization's purpose is to tell members and keep them there on a, 70, on a billion year contract for this precise reason. This is not theory, this is not conjecture. I have read the policy letters regarding this that are not released to the public. So, next time you approach a Scientologist in the media, don't ask him about his religious beliefs in regards to Xenu. Ask him about the policy letters that founded the Sea Organization and the conversation covered with his public in his what is now known as Ron's Journal 67, a transcribed tape recording where he describes the SEALG's responsibility to fix what happened here 75 million years ago. This is the true story behind Xenu and the real reason why the SEAL organization exists. Those few hundred people that joined him on those ships in 1967 and created the SEAL organization are truly insane, mad people bent on world domination. Thank you for your time. If you're a Scientologist just learning this, talk to your local Sea Org and ask for the policy letters referring to the, the conscription of the first ever Sea Org members. Thank you for your time. Hi there. I've had already a number of emails, <laughs> comments made regarding my explanation of the Xenu story. Uh, look, <laughs> I didn't write the policy. I'm quoting the policy to you. It is not an HCO policy letter or an HCO bulletin. It's a flag order written in 1967. There are three of them that go over these specific points that I've mentioned. Okay? We come back as the motto of the SEAL because they believe that they are part of the rebellion 75 million years ago that failed to stop Xenu. And now in modern times they are the rebellion, the Sea Org, that is going to fight and win over the, quote, Xenu and his loyal officers, who have now taken the position of psychiatry, World Bank leaders and Jews, okay? People have asked, why are there Jews in the Sea Org of Scientology then? The answer is simple. If you want to win, you have to... Scientology is a brainwash technology, okay? The Jews are not there because they know of the policy. They're there because they're victims, do you understand that? Do how many people actually know of these policy letters are very few. I know for a fact that in the Hollywood Guarantee Building there was at least one person that knows of it because I, that's where I was showing it. Okay, and that was from a very senior executive in the Scientology Network. How many others up above me knew about it? I do not know. I really don't. But the, the flag order exists. If you ask any SEALG member, any SEALG member, have they ever read flag order number one through to 600, the answer will be no, because most of them are vetted and not for their vision. Do you understand that? So, I'm sure this video is going to create a lot of debate. Um, I'm just trying to connect the dots for you people on why this organization is so powerful and has more than a thousand million US dollars in assets and so forth. Okay? I'm trying to connect the dots for you with the information that I do have. Okay? The policy is real. It's not fictitious. It's there. It's written. You can obtain it. It is in their files as we speak at the Hollywood Guarantee Building. Now, I know it's insane. Of course it's insane. This is why it's a cult. It's insane. I didn't make the cult up. I don't agree with the cult. I'm just giving you the information regarding its inceptions. Things should be starting to come very clear to people out there now about where the seal came from and why it really exists. All the fluff stories you heard about saving Scientology have absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever. Okay? I'm sure there'll be a lot of debate on this one.
okay, and it's not up to me to make assumptions of policies I have not read or assumptions of activities that I'm not aware of. I am telling you what I'm aware of, and I'm telling you of the policies I've firsthand seen, and they are real, and they exist, and they are there. And there are other people that are probably watching this video from the Sea Org that know these policies are certain, and they will not be able to refute their existence. Thank you. All right. Wow. Wasn't that interesting? The whole thing is good, but that last part, whoa. <laughs> Talk about controversial and juicy. Really makes me wonder, maybe that's why he got offered some package to be silenced. To be silenced. Is that the right word? Maybe that's why he got offered some money to be silenced. Um... <sighs> I mean, people have been known to be silenced um, and it occurs. But if he's full of bull crap, I don't think he would have been offered money and to, to shut up. Um, I believe him. He seems legitimate. He seems – that to me sounds like an honest person telling their experience in the church. So that flag order that he read is absolutely fascinating. It's like, whoa. Wow. And that's why I want to speak to him, because I want to, I want to know exactly what he saw. And wow, it's just so mind-blowing. You know, you look into Scientology and it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and just, whoa, you know. Um, but yeah, I understand it. I understand it. Um, it's now time to, uh, end off the podcast. But before I end off, I've got to end off with a quote, an L-I-H quote, an L. Ron Hubbard quote. Quote. And this is about government, and it's actually really quite interesting. Um, and it's an OSA, an Office of Special Affairs Network order from, uh, well, I don't know when it was written really. Um, it's called Principles of Government, um, and it's, again, just interesting information from L. Ron Hubbard. So let's hear this L. Ron Hubbard quote. quote it may be possible to conduct a government without direct taxation of individuals, but by causing the government to engage upon services to the population which obviate the necessity of personal taxation and all the ills to which that it is prone. It is highly possible that a government only enters upon individual taxation when its ability to produce service for its citizens has dropped below the point of non-existence. A government is justified only so long as it serves the people. A business goes bankrupt when it is not voluntarily contributed to. A government goes fascist. <sighs> L.I.H. So that's a really good quote because he's making a good point because we've got all these government services and they're taxing us to pay for these services. And it's like, well, why don't you... You run the public transport and the jails. Why don't you run those so that they're run to a profit and then you don't have to tax us? I mean, what a novel idea. This is where LIH thinks so out of the box and it's so brewing because I, I never thought of this idea. I mean, I'd thought of the idea that government departments, I remember once thinking about Australia Post and I remember thinking it should be turning a profit or something like that. Um. But I never, I never fully, I just had a little inkling at this idea, but the L. Ron Hubbard just fully laid out the whole idea. And he's totally right. It's totally good. It's like, yeah, what the hell is this deal with them taxing us so much? You know, and what we've got in Australia, which is so dodgy, is that all these government thingos like Australia Post and the jails and like um, public transport, they've been like privatized, right? But they're still government services so basically the profits that they make go to some 
dudes, <laughs> go, to, go to some dudes' back, po- back pockets, but also add taxpayer dollars are helping support these things. So it's just freaking crazy. It's even crazier because it's like, it's like they are making a profit, but what's crazy is we are also funding it. So it's so dodgy. I heard about some of the jails, like there's, there's government owned jails and there's not government, there's for profit jails and there's not for profit jails or something like that. But even the government owned ones are still privatized and it's all just a confusing mess because I reckon that the government ones own ones and the not government owned ones are both people have gotten in there and both worked out how to make the people who are running it. Both have worked out how to filter money into their bank accounts from the managing of those organizations. And and it's just so it's so dodgy to think that taxpayers' money is going towards helping these services, giving them the special contract that they're the only ones who can do this, which I think is wrong because that just creates a monopoly. And then they do pull a profit, but then they still have to take our taxpayer money. And and it's just, you don't understand how fucked up the Aussie government is. It's so, it's on it. It's worse. It's just crazy. It's just so ridiculous. Um, how things are like it's just wrong um and so that's why yeah i don't i don't know it's just i mean you got like you see things like the council like in america they'll have like a property tax and they'll call it a property tax and here it will be called like rates they have, we have like different names here. We have names that are more hidden as to what they actually are. Um, it's really like George Orwell. Like things are more like hidden as to what they are, and and you don't you don't know. But you look at how they calculate the property tax, and it's like, um, it's like this complicated formula as to what the house is worth and how old it is and what land thing. Oh, and it's just this dog's breakfast intentionally done that way so then each year they can fit all the numbers and charge you as much as as possible for the property tax but in america it's like property tax five percent yeah it's five percent it's called property tax and it's just five percent of what the property is worth and it's that simple but in australia it's like some crazy complicated formula. And what they do is that we, a few years ago, the property prices started going down. So the, the council weren't going to receive as much property tax. So then because it's a complicated formula, they fiddled the formula and changed the numbers around, the percentages around. So that then they still receive the same amount of money, even though the property prices were going down. So it's just so dodgy. And you go and you see parks and they've just got all... They've been landscaped all fancily and stuff, and you find out that the council owners are friends with the landscaping companies, and they 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 want to build these fancy parks, so then they make heaps of money. And then you drive around the side streets in Australia, and we've got these windy things to slow people down, but they're really just dangerous. Like especially for old people who aren't switched on, they could just not look right and smash into a lump of concrete. Like if I put a bunch of concrete on the road, I'll get accused of making a dangerous road but the government puts it in there and that means that they're making people drive slower and so it's actually a good thing but it's just ridiculous so you can't you're trying to drive through the side streets in melbourne and it's like there's all these windy things and shit and that's what our taxpayer dollars are going towards making our roads more difficult to and dangerous to drive on it's such a rort here and i know other places have problems but here's like whoa you know, you buy things here and you don't even know what, when you go to buy groceries, you don't even know where the tax is in there. Like, it doesn't really show it. Like, they don't really say to you, but in America, they're like $10 and then $2 tax. They really let you know that the government's fucking you, like, and, and taking your money. Like, you can know it, but here, you can go along and, and you can buy things and not even be aware of where the tax are within those things you're buying. And it's like, whoa. Um. And we've got like, let's say if you do like window cleaning or whatever, someone 
will have to charge you GST, like tax. But in America, some window cleaner can go and clean people's windows and he doesn't have to charge them tax on that. And the tax on our petrol, uh, you know, our gas is so high. Our gas prices are like, I think they're at least twice what the Americans are because because of the tax. And then cigarettes are like insanely expensive. And alcohol is really expensive as well. Like cigarettes are like... um, $26 $26 a packet or something. Like, it's just a joke. Anyway, so I'm going off topic, but this this quote here by Hubbard is just so intelligent, really. I, I totally agree with it. Um, so basically, the, the Australian government is just a bunch of business dudes that have got involved in the government and have turned it into a profit-making industry for them. But at the same time, they're still receiving tax. And then you find out that the police, all these criminals are getting away with tons of stuff and the police just cherry pick occasional crimes to investigate and catch and they feature it on the news so that everyone thinks they're doing a great and good job. Meanwhile, they might as well not get billions of dollars from the taxpayer because they're not really, they're not really worth it. They might as well just get, teach every citizen how to use a gun and say, hey, protect yourself. It's up to you, you your family, to look after yourself and your own safety. And we won't take all your tax money and stuff and, and blow it on ridiculous things. And you find out that the police are really there for political reasons like to institute COVID and to lock up protesters and all this stuff. And it's just so... It's very Mission Earth, actually. <laughs> That's why I love Mission Earth. I'm going to read Mission Earth again because it's so good. And now that I actually have an understanding of what the type of personality LIH was... Um. I think I'm going to be able to understand Mission Earth more because when I first listened to Mission Earth, I didn't know the crazy side to L. Ron Hubbard. But now I'm going to read it again and uh, I know a lot more about the world and, you know, and uh, what about Hubbard's personality is, so I'm going to get a lot out of it. But anyway, um, that's it for this for this show. I mean, wow, that... Last part of that interview, I think, was deep information, wasn't it? I mean, talk about how deep do things have to go. And I've got a briefing actually coming up soon about L. Ron Hubbard being a CIA agent. So Scientology, this Scientology adventure that I got into in 2010, it just goes deeper and deeper and layers of whoa, 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 whoa. And I think I've finally come to a conclusion as to what the truth about Scientology and Hubbard is. I think I fully worked it out. So I guess I've completed my little 10-year investigation into Scientology. But, yeah, the last thing is that he was, a, he was actually a government agent. <laughs> he was actually an a anti-communist CIA agent. And, um, but that doesn't mean his religion wasn't real and stuff, but it, it had a help and assistance, you know, and that's, that's partially why he was so successful and why he was so bold because he knew he had a secret group that was assisting him. The CIA did were quite powerful back then and stuff and they they like they assassinated the Australian prime minister and he just went missing at a beach but that was the CIA and they also killed um Kennedy but they're sort of you know probably the CIA but also it's like the freemasons because the freemasons it's all so tricky because they're groups within groups and stuff but where the Dealey plaza though where JFK was knocked off is in the shape of a triangle and there's a Freemason thing over there. So it's just a Freemason church or whatever in that area or something. So it's just all like, what the hell? And it's on the 33rd parallel from the uh, equator or something. So it's like, whoa. (laughs) But then the mafia, it seems that the mafia executed the actual mission. You see, so covers within covers. So everyone's just all confused and they think it's this group and that group and it's just like, whoa. Anyway, that's it for today's show. It's time for you to climb back out of this rabbit hole, out of this interesting Scientology world. I've been your host, Andy Nolch, the Space Cowboy. You have been listening to the Indie Scientology podcast. So remember, what you thought was impossible is possible. <laughs>